from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Betsy Peterson, and I'm the director of the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress, and I'm pleased to welcome you uh, for what I think will be another wonderful, wonderful day. This symposium marks the center's recent acquisition of the Henry Saposnik collection of more than 1,000 historic Yiddish radio broadcasts from the 1920s through the 1950s. Um, and the Saposnik collection, I should say, joins other, many other important research collections here at the American Folklife Center. The American Folklife Center was created by Congress in 1976 and placed at the Library of Congress to preserve and present American folklife through programs of research, documentation, archival preservation, reference service, live performance, exhibition, public programs, and training. You name it, we do it. And so I think it's really appropriate that the Saposnik Collection join all of our other um, important research collections and fill out uh, the offerings that the American Folklife Center has. And so we're really honored to have it as part of our collection. We're also honored to present this program in collaboration with the Hebraic section of the Library of Congress's African and Middle Eastern Division and, in, and with the assistance of the Division of Motion Pictures, Broadcast, and Recorded Sounds and with the additional support of many other colleagues around our, our uh, August institution. And I also want to thank the Yiddish of Greater Washington for their support of our wonderful reception um, last evening. Now, last evening's performance gave us a little bit of a taste of the treasures and the nuggets of the collection um, through Henry and Pete's wonderful performance and introduction to Yiddish radio. And the first panel and the really engaged discussion that followed, I think, provided a great foundation for beginning to understand the historical and cultural context of Yiddish radio and its relationship to mainstream American culture and mainstream American media. And I know we're going to hear much more about that today. And, uh, and I hope that the, that the discussion will be equally engaged. Um, one or two little announcements uh, before we sort of jump right in here. As I mentioned yesterday, these symposium or public programs that we present is an opportunity not only to share our collections with a broader public, but it's also an important strategy for us to add to our collections. It's an acquisition strategy, as we like to call it. And as part of that strategy, we record all of these sessions. So just so you know, we will be videotaping all of this. And once we videotape, we take everything back, we edit, and the proceedings of this symposium will be posted on a streaming online video. It will take um, probably a couple of months for that to be up and running and available to you all, but um, we think it's important to be able to share the discussion and the information that's shared today with, with a broader audience and for a longer period of time. So, as I think I heard a cell phone just a minute or so ago, if you have your cell phones turned on, please turn them off, unless you want it to be part of our, you know, part of posterity. So, without further ado then, I am going to turn this over to Laura Applebaum, who is the moderator for our first session, and again, welcome you all for another wonderful day. Thank you. Good morning. To, uh, I'm not usually an early riser, so uh, th thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm here as a result of a shidduch 
that was made between Sam Brylowski, who used to work uh, in recorded sound at the Library of Congress, and uh, Nancy Gross from the Folklife Center. So I want to thank uh, Nancy and Sam for inviting me to moderate the first panel on day two of this wonderful symposium. Ours is a collecting institution as well, and so I think it's so fabulous to celebrate the collection of this uh, wonderful, the accession of this wonderful collection uh, donated by Henry Saposnik. Uh, you know, a lot of times uh, as a collecting institution, you work with years with donors trying to tease out uh, things from their collections. So what a wonderful uh, gift this is to the nation and a fabulous uh, repository for it. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people here agree with me. Uh, I'm, you know, just in my 50s, and I really miss hearing Yiddish on a daily basis. Of course, my Bubby and Zadie spoke, and so my mother sometimes pulls her Yiddish out on occasion. Uh, and uh, my husband and I would sometimes pass the bedroom door where my in-laws would be staying, and we would hear Yiddish pillow talk. We were always wondering, is it good or is it bad? <laughs> you know, we're kind of trying to catch the words that we knew. Uh, there's a few things in our collection that relate to Yiddish, and because of my personal interest, I wish there were more. And so those of you who are uh, from the Washington community, if you think about the institutions you've been involved with and the uh, programs and the educational uh, sessions, if you have things that you think that we might be able to be a repository for at the Jewish Historical Society, we'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, panelist uh, Miriam Isaacs, in fact, recently donated a fabulous uh, Hebrew letter typewriter. I didn't know whether to say Hebrew lettered or Yiddish typewriter or how, how you do that. You might be able to tell me. Uh, that belonged to Harry Lerner, who was the founder of Yiddish of Greater Washington. We were just talking before that we really need to do uh, more about the history of uh, that fabulous organization. Uh, Peggy Perlstein is going to tell you a little bit about a copy of a book that we also have in our collections written in 1940 that was a little bit of a mystery to us until it was translated by Jim Feldman, who's also also active with uh, Yiddish of Washington, entitled 40 Years in Washington and written in 1940. So this is an invaluable resource about the uh, first decades of the 20th century that was uh, just a total mystery to us until it was translated. We have other things awaiting translation, uh, a book that's in Yiddish from the Combined Congregations of Washington. We think it's the Laws of Kashrut for Washington from 1908 to 1916. On a more modern uh, uh, basis, we hold uh, the Yiddish Cultural Festival's records from the late 1990s, and we have some great photographs of Yiddish theater being performed on the National Mall in 1976, maybe associated with the bicentennial by the Hebrews Actor Actors Union. But most pertinent to today, uh, we don't have any holdings in this regard, but most Washingtonians remember Max Resnick's long-running Yiddish radio show on Sunday mornings. It ran for 41 years, and its last call was uh, WNTR in Silver Spring. The uh, program combined uh, news and music. Uh, Resnick featured Hasidic and cantorial songs, Yiddish renditions of songs uh, from folks like the Beatles, Harry Belafonte, and Al Jolson. I'm sure many of the stations were carrying these. Yiddish songs such as She'll Be Coming Around the Catskills When She Comes, and Lox and Bagels played to the tune of Hava Nagila. He also had a weekly call-in competition where he challenged listeners to give the correct Yiddish word for his word of the week, and the reward was a choice of a barbecued chicken, three pints of ice cream, or a dozen bagels. Uh, so today's panelists um, are going to talk about Yiddish collections in their care, and also how the materials are informing uh, research. And I'll introduce them all at the start of the panel, and then each is going to speak uh, seriatim, if we can remember the order, and then we'll take Q&A at the end of all of the presentations. So I'll first give a brief bio, and I know that in the program there's a more lengthy bio because each of these folks deserves a more lengthy bio. Our first panelist will be Dr. Peggy Perlstein, who will tell us about Yiddish collections and materials here at the Library of Congress. She's worked at the library for close to 30 years, and she's currently the head of the Hebraic section of the African and Middle Eastern Division. The division chief is here. She is also active with the Association of Jewish Libraries for many years. Peggy is also an esteemed past president of our own Jewish Historical Society, and she remains very active on our board. 
Dr. Miriam Isaacs to my left, recently retired from teaching at the University of Maryland. She'll speak, it's a really interesting topic, Missing the Punchline, Mixing the Languages on Yiddish Radio. She specializes in and has taught Yiddish language and culture, as well as sociolinguistics. I had to practice that a little bit. Uh, David Rhine is an independent scholar. I think many of you might have met David last night. He'll teach us about cantorial music and Yiddish radio. He's a collector of cantorial recordings and a researcher of their history. Anne Hu, who is uh, at, the far, uh, at my far left, will speak to us about Yiddish collections here at the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress. She works here at the center as a series editor for geographical and topical finding aids, and she also works closely with the archival staff to improve and maintain access to the collection materials. So we'll start with Peggy Perlstein. Laura, thank you for your introduction. It's always good to see you, especially here at the library. The Hebraic section of the African and Middle Eastern Division is pleased to collaborate with the American Folklife Center in this landmark symposium on Yiddish American radio, thanks to the Folklife acquisition of the Henry Sapoznik Collection. The large attendance yesterday and so early this morning is testimony to the interest in the subject. My pleasant task is to tell you about some of the Yiddish language holdings in the Library of Congress. To begin, the Hebraic section is the custodial division for materials in Hebrew languages, such as Hebrew, Yiddish, and Ladino, all, which, all of which can be requested in our reading room. As keepers of these materials, we also serve as the research center and public face of the library for Hebraica and Judaica. Several items from the Hebraic section collections are on display today. They're over there. So go take a look when you have a chance. We just ask that you don't bring any coffee or noshes close to the materials. Um, I have some Yiddish plays, some sheet music, some postcards, uh, a Yiddish language Megillah, and a copy of our newest publication, Perspectives on the Hebraic Book, the Myron M. Weinstein Memorial Lectures at the Library of Congress. The book was published in June, and we've got it open to Zachary Baker's lecture on American Yiddish theater. The book is available in the library sales shop and at Amazon.com. Just a little commercial. Okay, the library has 20 reading rooms open to the public for research. I'll describe resources in just a few of them in the hopes that you can come away with an understanding of the richness and variety of the library's holdings and find avenues for research in unexpected places and collections. So a good way to figure out how to access materials in the library is simply to understand how the library is arranged. Um, here you can see we have general collections, area studies, and special materials. So in the general collections, you will find books, newspapers, other materials like that in English, French, Spanish, German, Italian, etc. In the area studies reading rooms, we're divided geographically, the Hispanic division, the European division, the African Middle Eastern division, and the Asian division. And so if you want materials in what we call squiggly languages, Japanese, we call them the Jackfi languages, besides being squiggly, uh, Japanese, Arabic, Chinese, Korean, Persian, Hebrew, and Yiddish, also Armenian, Amharic, Turkish, etc. You will either come to the African Middle Eastern reading room geographically or go to the Asian division geographically. And if you want something like special materials, if you want a film in Yiddish, you've got to go to the motion picture division. If you want some cantorial music, you've got to go to the recorded sound division. Or if you want to delve more into the Henry Sapoznik collection, then you go to the American Folk Life Center. 
So here in the Hebraic section, um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about our books, our journals, our newspapers, our microform, and our ephemera. And here you see an example of a manuscript in Yiddish. According to our finding aid for the more than 230 Hebrew script manuscripts in our collection, just four of them are in Yiddish. The collection's almost completely microfilmed, and the expectation is that the film will soon be digitized and made freely available online, together with its very detailed finding aid. While we have a number of finding aids that I'll describe in greater detail, please note that we've got lots of books, journals, and other materials still uncatalogued in the Hebraic section and in other sections of the library. While this varies in each custodial area, in the Hebraic section, we still have a manual card catalog, <laughs> which we use every day because we have several thousand Hebrew and Yiddish books not available online, cataloged, and so we've got to go to our manual catalog where they are arranged by title. So if you don't see something online, doesn't mean that we don't have it. Just ask one of us. Seder Kinot is one of two Yiddish books that came to the library as part of the Ephraim Dinard collections. The first two collections of more than 14,000 Hebraica books and pamphlets were given to the library by the New York philanthropist Jacob H. Schiff in 1912 and 1914. Daniel in the Lion's Den, this drama in Yiddish, uh, was also purchased and given to the library from the Ephraim Dinard collection, either in 1916 or 1920. So by 1920, the Hebraic section had a collection of 20,000 rare Hebrew, Yiddish, and Ladino language books and other materials. On October 25th, we'll celebrate the first gift in 1912 with an exhibit called Words Like Sapphires, a Hundred Years of Hebraica at the Library of Congress, 1912 to 2012. The exhibit will be up through the middle of March 2013 and will contain several items in Yiddish. I invite all of you re to return to the library over the next several months to see the exhibit and to attend our many programs. Now, here's an item that directly relates to radio or at least how a radio is built and works. Well, it's not an American radio, but perhaps all radio enthusiasts could have benefited from the guidebook at the time it was published in Kovno in 1934. I don't see any other holdings for this guidebook in WorldCat, the online catalog. And it came to the library from the Jewish Cultural Reconstruction Organization, which distributed airless material after the Holocaust. Here's an example of our most recent Yiddish language dictionary. It was hand-delivered a few weeks ago by a Russian physician who had immigrated to Israel two decades ago. He was visiting the United States for the first time and insisted that his cousin drive him from Philadelphia to Washington to give me the dictionary in person. He didn't know it wasn't around the corner. <laughs> the work is a labor of love, he told me, that began in Russia 30 years ago. Here's another recent dictionary, and this is the online cataloging record for it. It's a Yiddish-Japanese dictionary. Anyone in the room know Japanese and Yiddish? My correspondent was a professor of Yiddish at Tokyo. Okay, sounds good to me. But this is a very pricey dictionary. We paid $700 for it. So I hope more people learn Japanese as well as Yiddish. <laughs> Many of you are familiar with Hinda Amchanitsky's cookbook, the first Yiddish cookbook published in the United States in 1901. But according to a New York Times article two years ago, the gravestone of this Lower East Side restaurateur was found on the sidewalk in the vicinity where she lived. 
With help from Yivo, the gravestone, I understand, has now been placed on her grave, which I think is in Staten Island. Jenna Jocelyn wrote about this cookbook several years ago in one of her columns for the Forward. But I've been wondering, and Henry, maybe you know, if Yiddish radio picked up on the phenomenon of vegetarianism among some Jews, either in ads or in station programming. It was a Yiddish vegetarian journal published in New Jersey for many years. OK, thank you. This book of stories for children was published in Mexico City, but it's just one of many examples of the variety of imprints of Yiddish books and journals in our collections from around the world. Europe, the United States, South America, South Africa, and Australia. Here's the cover of a contemporary Yiddish magazine or journal. And if you look up at the top, you'll see that it's the Mountain Edition. Families spending the summer in a kochalane, a bungalow colony in upstate New York, supposedly can get their copy right away. Der Kinderspiel is a special section of one of a number of ultra-Orthodox contemporary family magazines that often have special sections for women, too. But not all of our contemporary Yiddish materials emanate from the religious community, and this Parisian journal is one example. And on an even more contemporary note, Aaron Taub, newly appointed head of the Israel Judaica cataloging team at the library and the symposium chair yesterday, has read from his published poetry in programs sponsored by the Hebraic section. You can watch his webcast talks from the library's homepage or the Hebraic section homepage. We have a large collection of Yiddish newspapers in hard copy as well as microfilm. The holdings of all the titles in microform are described in the online catalog. More than 300 large boxes of these catalog newspapers are now stored in the library's off-site facility in Fort Meade, Maryland, but they are available for researchers to request. Here you see a Canadian newspaper and an Argentinian Yiddish newspaper. The Washingtoner Yiddische Stimme is one example of a Yiddish newspaper that was published here in Washington. Here you can see the Hebrew side. And if you take a look at the English side and take a look at where the arrow's pointing, you can see that there was some kind of discord in the community in 1921. And that's why they started this newspaper. So Laura, maybe you know something about that. If not, maybe you can find out for us. Jim Feldman, a highly involved member of Yiddish of Greater Washington, recently worked with organization members and led the translation and publication of this directory of Yiddish-speaking Washington from the 1940s Radio Days era. And Laura spoke about this before. Here you see one of the photos from the original Yiddish book that was compiled by Morris Alex. And of course, in more recent decades, we've collected Yiddish of Greater Washington's newsletter. In addition to newspapers, among our many microfilm collections is this example of documents from the Russian State Jewish Theater. We have a number of special collections uh, in the Hebraic section, uh, one of them is our collection of 1,200 Yiddish play scripts. And we've got one of them, two of them on display today. Um, Zachary Baker uh, compiled the bibliography that was put online. Um, and he had help from Bertha Sohn. She was born Bertha Schooler. And she was the sister of Tzvi Schooler. So she lived here in Washington, and she came into the library. And actually, she was the one who also selected 77 of those Yiddish plays that were digitized and are available um, on the library's website. We have a large collection of Yiddish sheet music, 
more than 5,000 pieces. A wonderful finding aid was published by the late Irene Heskis. Uh, I have some pieces of Yiddish sheet music on the table there. Um, it was a summer project for three summers for several interns. I had them create a database based on the Heskis finding aid and scan all of the sheet music. 1,500 pieces of sheet music, and I think they're all from pre-1923 before their copyright restrictions, are scheduled to become part of the Performing Arts Encyclopedia at the library. And the items will also be featured in Song of America. The scheduled release date is this month. We have not scanned our Yisker books but we've taken the list of books scanned that appears on the New York Public Library website and used it to check against our own holdings. We now have more than 900 cataloging records in this finding aid that you can just go online to for memorial books for towns in Europe destroyed in the Holocaust. So in addition to the name of the town, there are often smaller towns or shtetlach around, and so we've added those to our database. So it makes it a much um, more sophisticated finding aid um, for finding these little towns. The prints and photographs reading room has more than 15 million items in its holdings. More than two million are digitized and available online. Again, if you don't see it, please ask a specialist. I'll return to the George Grantham Bain News Service collection later. Here's an image from the Federal Theater Project. The Federal Theater Project, WPA project during the Depression, contains more than 9,000 negatives all of them have been digitized here at the library, and metadata is currently being added for each image. A release date will be announced soon for the images to go online. So it's my hope that there will be more images for Yiddish language performances. I don't know if you can see this one, but it was performed in California in 1939. I was fortunate to see some of these Russian postcards when they arrived at the library last year. As noted in this online cataloging record, there is a finding aid which includes a section on Jews and Jewish settlements. Hopefully about 50 items will soon be available online digitized to let researchers know about the new collection of more than 21,000 Russian postcards. The Rare Book and Special Collections has items of Yiddish interest as well. Paul Averick, who died in 2006, was a professor at Queens College and Columbia University in New York. His collection of more than 20,000 items on the anarchist movements in Russia and the United States include newspapers and other materials in Yiddish. But here is just one image uh, of something that's in the Rare Book and Special Collections Division, a cataloging record for a program for the drama Shylock and His Daughter, staged at the Yiddish Art Theater in New York in 1947. There are many other additional sources for research at the Library of Congress. For example, we have a whole collection of Lithuanian language newspapers in the European division filmed by the department with Department of Defense camera equipment in Vilnius. The Yiddish language newspapers from that collection are available in the Hebraic section. David Boder was a psychologist interested in the technique and technology of the oral history interview he traveled to Europe in 1946, conducted interviews in nine languages with DPs uh, on what was then state-of-the-art wire recorders. And those interviews are here at the Library of Congress and the Holocaust Museum. Let me share with you some snapshots of information on Yiddish American radio from two databases, Variety Archives and ProQuest Historical Newspapers online. 
So first I, I did just a quick search under Yiddish radio, and then I narrowed it to Nachum Stuchkov. And here, here you can see the play, which we've got on display in the other room. And here you can see under Yiddish uh, plays in Variety uh, newspaper, there's something about in a Jewish grocery store. <clears throat> this is from the Boston Jewish Advocate of 1936. So there are lots of different places to search, even in online databases. Don't forget the copyright collection. This is a um, cataloging record for a Yiddish language film. Copyright deposit records after 1978, available to search from the library's website. Before 1978, you can go downstairs in this building to the copyright division and go through hundreds, if not thousands, of card file drawers looking for material that you never knew existed. <coughs> And finally, this last image is from the collection of the early 20th century George Grantham Bain News Service Agency, available online from the Prints and Photographs Division homepage. Now that my own daughter and her family live in Brooklyn, I ride or even walk over this bridge. The caption that accompanied the photo, snapped in 1919, described a woman praying on the Brooklyn Bridge. Since most of the Bain photographs of Jews were taken around the high holidays and outside of synagogues, I think it might be safe to say that this woman is reciting Tashlich prayers in the hope that all sins will be cast off into the river, the East River, at the start of the new year. Let me conclude my own presentation this morning by wishing those of you who will soon be celebrating Rosh Hashanah a good year. Thank you. Um, Moshe Pippik, please. <laughs> I never said that before. <laughs> okay. Yep, let's go. Listen. Ladies and gents, catch kiss and gents. Okay, so ladies and gents, catch kiss and gents. This playful greeting for the folks who listen to Yiddish radio or uh, Yiddish records by Benny Bell. I actually have a physical album of his here, Kosher Comedy. Um, as he took on the persona of Pincus the Peddler, or here Moshe Pippik, the Shatchan, or matchmaker. Pippik in Yiddish means belly button. Um, I hear two common complaints. I hear two common complaints involving Yiddish. One is that parents used it as a secret language. The other, a frustration at not getting the Yiddish punchlines of jokes. Yiddish, for most children and grandchildren of immigrants, became a secret code associated with older family members or schlocky jokes. Many Jews grew embarrassed at being greenhorns, grina, recent immigrants. But for those who enjoyed Yiddish, and for the greenhorns who needed Yiddish, radio programs spoke your language, told the news that most mattered, and brought your culture into the home. I would like to present some of the funniest Yiddish entertainers and discuss them in the context of li linguistic shift and cultural continuity. The comic material of Yiddish popular songs shaped social awareness of their audience and helped bring to American culture a different kind of worldview. 
I look forward to using the uh, radio archives at the Library of Congress, which will provide valuable authentic materials. I here mention only a few popular entertainers who wrote and recorded comic songs, artists who catered to an audience in transition, linguistically and culturally. In terms of language, the shift went from Yiddish to a mix of Yiddish and English, or English in a fake accent, with a few hackneyed Yiddish words thrown in. In social terms, the transi transition meant addressing issues of self-image and adapting to America. Indeed, the wisdom of Yiddish topical songs and street philosophers gave their working class audience a kind of education, a night school, as was mentioned yesterday, about how to manage an America. And they often did it with a wink and a laugh. It was an important cultural stance, reconciling the shlemiel with a stereotypical image of a hero in America. We will see how old world and new collided when the shlemiel took on the cowboy. Um, the uh, Scotchman of Orchard Street, please. Menashe Skolnick. Listen. Listen for the English and the Yiddish. Ich bin Mekin gewesen, a Batschmann, Flick Batschmann, wie ein Rest mit Appetit. Ich kämpfe in Galicia, regular Scotchman, I am the Scotchman from Orchard Street. Lura, lura, lura. Salmon, my Zayde McCusher, my Nina McBailey, my Uncle McTeed, Billy Hessenham, who is Master Hesskusher. I am the Scotchman from Orchard. Okay, Street. just a taste. So, in this mix of Yiddish and English from the Scotchman of Orchard Street by theater and radio personality Menashe Skulnik, the Scot cuts a strange figure. He's a kind of hybrid of the laconic warrior hero who is moved to Orchard Street, uh, a street on the Lower East Side popular for bargain seekers. Skolnik Scott is a Galiziana, and he sings in a nebbishy nasal voice with a thick Yiddish accent. Ich bin McPinje gewesen a Watchman, vleg Watchen wie jener ist mit Appetit. Ich kim von Galicia, regular Scotchman. I am an Turalura. So, um, he says, a watchman, only in that he's watching somebody else eating. He introduces his family, adding Mac to many Yiddish names, like his aunt Macbela. <laughs> he stereotypes both the Scots and the Jews as sharing stinginess. McPinya follows somebody to lunch and lets the other person pay. The stanzas are in rapid Yiddish. Only the refrain and occasional words like vach and hem are in English. This kind of humor was a tension breaker for the Greenhorns. They contrasted their own small stature and looks with the tall, square-jawed jo other. It helped the Grine to feel comfortable in their own skins. Skolnik was comfortable himself as a Yidl, a small Jew born in Poland in 1892. He ran away to join a circus at age 10, came to the US to join a Yiddish theater company, and was cast in comic roles as a Shlemiel. Instead of being embarrassed at having an accent, at his looks, at having an old-fashioned name, he embraced his identity and employed it to comic effect. He found humor in the idea of a Jew as anything but himself. Take his song, Cordova the Bronx Casanova. I am famous from Paris to Dover. When I make love, I'm in demand. Each old maid wants to put her future in my hand, he says. He's a most improbable lover. In I'm Sam the Man That Made the Pants Too Long, he's an incompetent tradesman who explains the American workplace. Sam claims that a foreman is a man who stands around and doesn't work. Sam tried that and got fired. No, is it my fault, he says. Skolnik had to adapt <laughs> as his audiences dwindled. He grew up in a world with millions of Yiddish speakers, but Yiddish culture could not withstand the forces of assimilation and wars. Skolnik had said that 40% of his Yiddish theater was in English. After Yiddish theater hit its peak in the 20s, performers had to scrounge for work. Still, Yiddish, in the heyday of, Yidd of radio, there was daily news were daily newspapers, theater, and commerce. Yiddish still linked you with Jews from other countries and from different regions. 
Immigrants had tried to recreate elements of the old country in the US, <clears throat> founded societies of people from their own town or region. New York became a new shtetl. Even city place names were Yiddishized, pronounced Nev York and the Bronsk. Back then, folks in uptown New York may have looked down on the hyphenated Americans, but on the Lower East Side and other smaller enclaves, Jews worked and shopped side by side with immigrants from many countries. Um, this ethnic melange itself became fodder for humor. Leo Fuchs <clears throat> wrote a song called Coney Ireland Wedding, and Ich bin a kleiner Chinaman is one of his numbers. In America, you lived and worked with Italians, Swedes, and Greeks, very different from the relations to the old, world, old country, Poles, Ukrainians, Russians, and Romanians. This change needed interpretation. The Yiddish Fred Astaire, dancer, actor, and writer Fuchs, was born in Poland in 1911 and began acting in Polish at the age of five. He performed at the Warsaw Cabaret at age 17 and moved to New York in 1935. He performed in many English and Yiddish plays and wrote much of his own material. In his song, Hopalong Knish, a cowboy is the butt of his humor. As ich es mein dinner sitzt affair beim Tisch, he says. In Der Millionaire from Delancey Street, the poor guy gets to walk behind the rich uptown man and gets to inhale his smoke. In Uncle Sam and Reb Yisrael, he combines patriotism for America with a new kind of piety. Both countries are to be democratic and friends forever. Sis far historia monument, he says. Some Jews chose to hold on to their greenness. New immigrants came in, some valued living, some valued living in both languages and embracing both cultures. If everyone could read, couldn't read Yiddish, records and radio could connect people with a broad range of listeners. Bilingualism added to fun. Knowing more than one language made Greenhorns able to engage in ling linguistic play and punning. Yiddish performers tailored their novelty songs and routines to a broad audience, and much of the material came from vaudeville and theater. As Yiddish radio entered the scene in the 30s, the culture in Europe was rapidly changing. A younger generation was urbanizing. From Europe, fresh talent continued to enrich Yiddish cultural life, including the refugees who came before and after World War II. The Greenhorn crowd enjoyed making fun of pomp. Tore ya dot, don't spit on the floor, use the cuspidor, what do you think it's for, was an example. <laughs> in America, even Yiddish dialects took on new meaning. If assimilated Jews looked down at you, then as a litvak, you could make fun of Galicianos, and Galicianos could make fun of themselves. If you, don't, if you don't look like a Scot or a cowboy, you can laugh at the cultural contrast. Yiddish is an open language of low status, historically considered a jargon by many. This openness allowed greenhorns to take ideas but interpret them in America in, America in unpredictable ways. Performers and producers played to mainly working class people who wanted to be amused. Language gaps could be overcome with lots of IDDs and chiribiri bims and lists of food. Sk <laughs> a lot of food. Sk Skolnik and Fuchs, born and raised in Europe, played to audiences that knew a lot of Yiddish and little about American culture. Reuben Doctor, who too had his roots in Europe, but sh um, and shaped Greenhorn's perceptions of America. He was a prolific lyricist, born in Bessarabia, and came to America in 18, in, uh, came to America to play vaudeville. He published more than 80 Yiddish lyrics. His best known, Ich bin a border by mein Weib, I'm a border at my wife's, which, which celebrates capitalism in a strange way. In this case, the freedom to transform marriage into a commercial arrangement. You get getter, better care from your wife if you're a client, and you'd still have your freedom. In Doctor's Mira Nickel, Dira Nickel, it's also liberating. It features a tram conductor who takes a nickel for everyone the company gets. It's only fair because the company has many nickels. American commercialism ranks high in the, in the uh, mockery uh, of uh, American culture. For American-born Mickey Katz, his audiences were far more comfortable in English and in pop cult American pop culture. 
He can still occasionally venture into fluid Yiddish. Can we hear David Crockett? No, no, um, Mickey Katz, the guy with the sausages. That's it? Oh, wrong thing. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, never mind. Forget about the Shlemiel of Fortune. I can do it. <laughs> okay, born in the wilds of De Delancey Street, home of gefilte fish and kosher meat, he flicked him a chicken when he was only three. So Mickey Katz penned this and other great things. Um, so, David Crockett, our hero, was born in the wilds of Delancey Street, home of gefilte fish. The original hero, uh, David Crockett, the guy with the funny hat, he was actually, according to this song, uh, kind of crude and murderous. He hugged Indianas, uh, kills Indians. Not such an appealing figure in terms of Yiddish culture. When he's relocated to Delancey Street, He's crude, he chews tobacco, and he hacket and gechacket, which hacket is what you sound you make when you chew too much tobacco. Um, and hacket rhymes with crocket, which is rather clever. Uh, other cowboy parodies are Heim auf Range and Borsch Riders in the Sky. <laughs> Katz, born in the US in 1909, reveled in the identity of Jewish Americans. For his jokes to succeed, he needed his listeners to be familiar with popular American culture. He called himself a double ethnic smash. We can see from Katz's work that as more English crept in, Yiddish took on different significance, transitioning from a natural language of expression to a vehicle of nostalgia and humor as a component of English. He uses food jokes as in 16 tons, I went to work in a delicatessen for 30 toller and plenty to fressen, uh, he loaded 16 tons of salami, he's a laborer. English Yiddish comedy included Shlomil of Fortune, which you just heard a little bit of, uh, the barber of Shlomil, it's a machaya in Hawaii, and the poipel kishke eater. <laughs> like cats, <laughs> Benny Bell was born to an immigrant family in New York in 1906. He wrote some 600 songs and recorded in Yiddish, some Hebrew, but mainly in English. In 46, he took on the persona of Pincus the Peddler, Brooklyn, USA. One of his numbers is a parody of Yiddish radio, especially the commercials, uh, mocking the, the jingle with Lem Lemke's bed bug powder, use cockroach powder, dry mula tug. Be Bell songs could be very bawdy, using innuendo and risque lyrics. He wrote, um, my grandfather had a long one. The <laughs> There ain't no Santa Claus, and everybody wants my fanny. Um, everybody wants my fanny, <laughs> um, wants to see my fanny, wants to hold my fanny, but she loves no one but me, so don't touch my fanny. Um, the back of this album, it says, Jewish American novelty tunes, mostly in English, with incidental Yiddish featuring such gems as Pincus the Peddler, Mazel Tov, It's a Boy, Romania, and many others. Um, so to my conclusions, while many sneered at this let your hair down stuff of Yiddish shtick, it was sheer fun and wit, evidence of resilience and intelligence. The process this took offers broader insights into points of cultural intersection and tension. No, you didn't have to pretend to be a gun toting hero. You could be a shlomil of fortune. Indeed, you come to the truth that everybody is a shlomil, even the supposed heroes a worldview later echoed in the work of Mel Brooks. This cumulative body of material holds broader meaning for ethnic radio in many languages today, in media where the performers and their audiences possess a common repertoire. The laughter breaks social tension. Humor can help immigrants push the cultural boundaries as peoples bump up against one another. Those who wield the microphone are at once insiders and outsiders, poking fun at their own folk but also at the various faces of America. A lesson for today is that despite the views of many educators and language purists, language mixing is natural and healthy, and so is laughter.
I don't know, but for some reason, I feel like I've been here before. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everybody. There are many topics that we can discuss today in reference to cantorial music on the radio. However, our focus here today will be about the development and progression of number one, cantorial music, and number two, the cantor him himself, as I will explain. For those who might not be familiar, which I'm sure you are, a cantor is someone who leads the congregation in service and prayer. I have divided the past 150 years into a few sections based on the major developments and changes that happened during the course, which changed the cantor and his music leading up to the ultimate new phenomenon known as Yiddish radio on the air, which I will save for last. Stage one is an era I would like to call the cantor at the pulpit. In or around the years 1860 or so, the cantor, the chazan, was someone whose education and knowledge of music was minimal. The little education he did have was mainly taught to him by the fellow old cantor in the shtetl. Some cantors also took limited voice lessons from a local teacher who he himself knew very little. He would lead the congregants of the synagogue on the Sabbath, holidays, high holidays. His job was mainly at the pulpit. Of course, he was obligated to do weddings and funerals. The music exercised by the cantor was beautiful, warm, and expressed the Jewish pain and suffering in exile, but wasn't really a composition, a musical arrangement. It was Nusach style, prayer style, definitely not a Western style composition. To demonstrate to you what I mean by this style and prayer, let's listen now to a rare 78 recording sung by cantor Abraham Minkowski. The recording was made in New York in around 1905 by a company named UHDNC, United Hebrew Disc and Cil Cylinder. Since the company was Jewish owned and the entertainment was primarily for a Jewish audience, perhaps this might be an early version of Yiddish radio. So let's listen in. I hope this gave you an idea. On one last note before we move on to the next stage. During this time period, the terms a world-renowned chazan was non-existent. <laughs> because the cantor leading the service in one shtetl wasn't really known to the people in the shtetl next door, it wasn't even a goal that a cantor could have dreamt of. The cantor didn't have a great income, just a few dollars the congregation paid him. Stage two is what I would call cantor at the pulpit and 
in concert. In the years around 1890 and beyond, we find chazunim, cantors, took the roads and started traveling with choirs from town to town to lead the services in various synagogues and concerts. The great master, Cantor Yaakov Shmuel Magovsky, known as Zeidel Rovner, acclaimed great fame when he traveled throughout cities of Poland with a big choir to lead the services and concerts. The songs Rovner sang were of a new style. His compositions took between a half an hour to an hour. Evidenced by the records he did for Columbia, records here in New York on September 1917, three records, two sides each, to combine one single song. Traveling Cantors was a new era in Cantorial Horizon that greatly changed the Cantor situation. It bought them great fame and lots of money. In all the cities that they performed, they were showered with gifts and money and whatever else you can think of. The Chazen was the Jewish celebrity. People became like addicts to go listen to traveling cantors. Then after the Sabbath or a concert, huge debates and arguments arose, arose on street corners and cafe houses. Who was the better Chazen? Being the main source of entertainment, the cantor was the star, the toast of the town, making many pans, uh, something that wasn't, uh, un was unheard of before that. Fans became so engrossed into certain cantors. For instance, fans of the great Chazen Zeidel Rovner became known as Zeidel Isten, Zeidel Isten. Um, going right along with our theme of yesterday of uh, communist and capitalist <laughs> Fitting well in. Stage three, uh, we enter in a stage of uh, 78 recordings, RPM recordings. I'd like to call this er error Cantor at the Pulpit, Concert, and Recording Studio. In the year 1902, a few of the now well known cantors, like Cherini, Sorota, Bladovsky, Burekshaw, Meyershaw, and some others signed contract by, by recording labels to record a series of cantorial masterpieces. So their prayers would now be sold all over Europe and eventually in the US and would bring, bring them great fame and uh, a promising income. These recordings would range in length between three and four minutes. With this, a new style was created. It brought a major change to the quality and style of the cantor's chants and prayers because it had to fit a certain time frame. A major contrast to the long drawn out compositions. These recordings made the cantors world renowned cantors, or as they say in Yiddish, Aveltschazen. Invitations and traveling fares with promising amounts of money were guaranteed to cantors if you were to travel the cities around the world. The cantors accepted. They set sail to the US, South America, England, even South Africa. With time, a lot more cantors got contracts to record on 78 records. This change was a major change to the way contracts between the cantors and their congregations were written up. Up until this point, the, the contract would bound the cantor to be there for most Shabbos, Shavosim, Saturdays, ho holidays, and especially high holidays. Now, with this new era of traveling and uh, being a world star, the congregation was more than satisfied to have the cantor for high holidays only.
overall, I would say 35% of the Jewish 78s were cantorial. All of them, the Chazunim, started in earning a more money and great fame. Being a cantor was a good profession. Stage four, Jewish radio on the air. We now enter into an era of cantorial music on the airwaves. And around 1926, as we heard yesterday, Jewish Yiddish radio was established. Radio was the opportunity for many cantors who for various reasons didn't get to record on 78s to now be heard. On a side note, Yiddish and Hebrew songs became very much part of the cantorial repertoire, although it had started a little before. The cantor would go down to the radio studio and pe perform on air, live, for a live audience in studio and even sometimes in a theater with as much as three to 400 seats. Of course, people from all over the city would tune into the station to hear the cantor on the radio. The music itself was an upgrade, being better in quality and better in style. The length of the piece would be approximately five, six, or even seven minutes. The cantor was able to express his musical ideas and feelings freely. He wasn't so time restricted as the records. Being a great equalizer between the long, drawn out compositions and the very short 78s. Jewish radio, in my opinion, for those who care, <laughs> was a fine combination of all of the above mentioned stages of cantorial music. It represented the cantor at the pulpit being that the live broadcasts, broadcasts of service and prayers were heard live on the air, as I will play in a little bit, which in essence made the radio an actual pulpit. You can actually sit at home and be on the synagogue at the same time. It was also performed for a live audience. Tickets were sold, just like a concert. I would also argue that radio being an entertainment in your own living room was a substitute or replacement for the 78 records, which makes the record, the records, an actual, the radio, an actual recording studio. How appropriate for a Friday morning at the 10 o'clock hour to play some chazunas, WEVD for years had a Chazunas program Friday morning to prepare Jews for the holy day of Sabbath with some cantorial selections. Our radio star today is none other than Chazun Moshe Genshov. I have chosen Cantor Genshov due to the fact that I think he represents all four stages and transformations of the cantors and cantorial music as we have just discussed. As a boy in the early 1900s, he sung in the choir of Cantor Shulman in Odessa. He himself became a great cantor and composer. He recorded on 78s as well. And later on was a huge radio star. Our first selection here today, interestingly enough, is a live performance of a wedding service ceremony for the Friedman family. No idea who it is. In 1948 giving you a glimpse of radio's pulpit performances. I edited the track a little bit to fit our time frame. This evening is Cantor Genshoff, very well known to radio audience, Moshe Genshoff. <laughs>
wire conducted by Mr. Nadell with the opening solo passage by our cantor. This evening, Cantor Ganchoff, dressed as in, in his traditional black robes, very regal looking with a purple lined talus. The choir now marches back to its place, and shortly our processional will begin. <laughs> Our next selection is of Cantor Genshov as well. On November 30th, 1947, for the Stumers Pumpernickel Company. <laughs> On an interesting note, this selection is a Hebrew Palestinian song, Ma Yafim Halelot. Track three. As Moshe Legenchov ranked on seats this Palestinian lead, Ma Yefim Malelot Bikna, Vishem Zenendenech in Kna. Since we are in Washington, I thought it would be a little bit uh, appropriate, uh, some politics. So uh, our next selection is of Cantor Genshov in the same program. Mo Oshif, how can we bless you, God? This is a song in reference to the UN resolution to establish the state of Israel. <laughs> Liturgisches, Ma Oshif. Oh, <laughs> 
I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my friend Noam Brown, who couldn't attend, for helping me in many ways. I'd like to finish up by saying that with the work of Henry Zaposnik, the Library of Congress, and their preservation, these radio broadcasts have now become priceless recordings from radio's recording studios. Thank you all for listening. Hi, I'm Ann Hoog, and I'm a Folklife Specialist in the Reference Staff at the American Folklife Center here at the Library of Congress. I'm going to talk about some of the Yiddish materials in the American Folklife Center's archive. I'm just going to talk about a few of these, but there is a more complete finding aid to all of our Jewish, Yiddish, and Hebrew collections, um, which are in the archive, which are about 45 or 50 collections in that um, category, which is on the Folklife Center's website. Just for a little context, uh, the center's archive was founded at the Library of Congress in 1928 as the Archive of American Folk Song, where its aim was to collect and preserve local and regional folk song and spoken traditions as they were passed down orally through communities and families. From very early on, the primary collection format that emerged was in the form of sound recordings made in people's homes and communities by ethnomusicologists, folklorists, and ethnographers from around the US and the world. As a result of this production of ethnographic sound recordings, the archive grew quickly and over the next 20 years amassed more than 10,000 sound recordings of spoken and sung traditions. It wasn't until around that time, though, in 1948, that the archive acquired its first collection with any significant Jewish content. That collection came to us via the New York Public Library. The archive was first contacted by NYPL in January 1947 inquiring about the possibility of borrowing a disc recording machine and some blank discs in an effort to, quote, record songs from minority groups in New York City. The recordings were to be made by ethnomusicologist Charles Hoffman, who worked at NYPL at the time. The archive thought this to be a valuable addition and granted the request. Because of this equipment loan arrangement, any recordings made using Library of Congress machine and discs would then be copied for addition to the Folk Archives collections. Hoffman recorded 23 aluminum discs, totaling about three hours of audio, containing folk songs representing a variety of ethnic groups residing in New York City, including several examples of Yiddish songs. I know this is hard to see, so I'm going to read a little bit um, from this. But shown here is an example of documentation that accompanied the recordings that came. The typing was likely done by Hoffman, and the cataloging numbers, written rather boldly, were written in by archive staff, each number representing a disc. The log shows that these discs include recordings of 19th century Eastern European Yiddish songs sung by Ruth Rubin and were recorded on May 30th, 1947. Now, Rubin came to be quite a prominent Yiddish folk song collector beginning around the same time, and her name is going to come up again later in my presentation. Also included here are a number of children's games and songs sung in Yiddish by Michael Rubin, age nine, and Ora Mendelssohn, age 11, and recorded on June 4th, 1947. I'm going to play two of these short children's pieces. Um, the first will be, if you can see the big number 9091 up there, referred to on the log as um, the second cut called the Nonsense Song, or Aganeva. Then there will be a pause, and the next song will be from side B of that same disc called Winter Song. 
Michael Rubin and Ora Mendelssohn will now sing a Nazi song called Agoneva, in which a burglar broke into a poor rabbi's house and found nothing at all. All the shirts that he stole were torn and packed and so on. By my ribbon is Gavazin, is Gavazin, by my ribbon, by my ribbon is Gavazin, ah, Geneva. Driven home to read even her garment locked to spin with letter, by my ribbon is Gavazin, ah, Geneva. Driven off to read even her garment locked to spin with letter, by my ribbon is Gavazin, ah, Geneva. Driven him to read each single giant snob and peel and fleagle, by my ribbon is Gavazin, ah, by my ribbon is Gavazin, is Gavazin, by my ribbon, by my ribbon is Gavazin, ah, Geneva. Boy, help me, Kim Tonger, kind quest is Nettor. Der Kummen is Devinter, Devinter is Sangor, Devinter is Sangor. Der Freit kind and kind day is, hier kommt die Gesichter hey. Mit der weißen Burg und Tee ist, mit der weißen Gräuter Brain, mit der weißen Gräuter Brain. Das tolle und jelde Jochte, der heute zu der Erd, mit sicher besser Schochte, und Kerl und Kerl und Kerl, und Kerl und Kerl und Kerl. Mit Schläge bis die Felde, verfreuen steht die Wahl. Die Felde und die Felde, sie brummen kalt bis kalt, sie brummen kalt bis kalt. The next Yiddish um, acquisition that came into the archive was in 1951. It's called the Howard Bloomfield and Harry Gelpar recordings of Yiddish songs. These recordings were made in Los Angeles, California in 1949 under the supervision of folklorist Wayland Hand. Bloomfield and Gelpar were graduate students in the Department of Germanic Languages at UCLA. And though there had evidently been plans to expand this recording project, it resulted in only about 15 songs being recorded. Shown here is a log, um, a recording log from that collection and includes song titles, dates, recordings, and names of performers. Yes, that's what we like to see <laughs> with that type of documentation. One thing that makes this collection interesting, despite its small size, um, it's beyond the notes of who, what, where, and when the recordings were made. It also includes some transcripts typed in Yiddish with English translations. Shown here side by side is uh, one of the selections, A Song for Joseph, shown in Yiddish on the left with its English translation on the right. And here's a close up um, to make it a little bit easier to see. I found these transcriptions interesting and didn't really know the, the story behind them. Um, so in, after digging through um, some correspondence, found that neither collectors nor the donor made these transcripts. But the donor, Wayland Hand, says in a letter to Duncan Emmerich, who was then the head of the folklore section at the Library of Congress, that the original transcriptions were done in Hebrew characters. No English translations were provided. So Hand sent them to Mike Weinrich of the Yiddish Scientific Institute of New York, YIVO, and asked him if he and his staff could, quote, put the materials in a more usable shape. Unfortunately, we didn't appear to have been sent the original transcripts um, done in the Hebrew characters, uh, which would have been really interesting to have alongside this, um, but at least, at least we have this. In 1966, uh, we acquired the Ben Stonehill collection. Um, this letter, which I'm gonna read from, um, is from April 1949, when Stonehill first approached the archive with his recordings he had made on a wire spool. He wished to undertake quite an ambitious project of recording and documenting Jewish folk songs, which he describes in this letter. I'll read from the last paragraph. With the aid of a wire recorder, I've been engaged in collecting over a thousand heretofore unknown, never before recorded, notated, or published Yiddish and Hebrew folk songs, ballads, etc., from the lips of hundreds of refugees, ghetto, and DP survivors could have gone on taking down a thousand more each year, but began to transcribe texts, melodic lines, and realized the sheer clerical work that faced me. Until a subvention appears from somewhere, I'm plodding away at piecemeal transcriptions, transliterations, and translations, and looking for assistance and a publisher. Bibliography, definitive index of all existing songs in print, biographical, historical notes, all this and more <laughs> is envisioned in this volume. Tentatively titled, Adventures of a Jewish Ballad Hunter. Any suggestions? 
Emmerich replied that he would, in fact, like to add the wire recording to the archive, but of course goes on to say that there were no funds to provide for the rest of his project. Nothing more was pursued about this wire recording for another 16 years when Stonehall contacted the library again in September 1965. He was then incapacitated by malignant cancer and wanted to be sure his recordings were preserved at the Library of Congress. By this time, the wire recordings had been copied onto reel-to-reel -reel tapes. The tapes were shipped to the library along with recording logs identifying each song title. And again, the details here don't matter except just to see that this is a long piece of paper with a very long list of songs. Um, this page showing songs numbered 623 to 681 uh, we have these same typed pages for more than a thousand songs. So not only did he record them, he typed the titles out of all this material. Um, many, many of these songs are, are in, um, in, in Yiddish in this collection. The uh, duration of the collection is approximately 36 hours of material. Stonehill was driven to preserve the repertoire <coughs> of Eastern European songs he feared was being lost among Jewish immigrants living in New York City after World War II. And those Stonehill perhaps never fulfilled his dream project in full, what he did accomplish is invaluable to the preservation of these songs. Now back to Ruth Rubin. In 1969, the archive purchased the Ruth Rubin collection of Yiddish folk songs and folklore. This collection consists of field recordings made mostly by Rubin in the late 1940s through 1960s in Jewish communities in various locations in the Eastern US, Britain, Israel, and Canada where she had grown up in Montreal. She recorded hundreds of songs and interviews during the span of years. The collection we have here contains 125 reel-to-reel -reel tapes totaling approximately 70 hours. Shown here is a letter discussing the shipping of 40 of these tapes. She shipped them over a number of years um, in batches. One of the most wonderful things about this collection is the documentation that accompanies it. And this letter helped explain to me why the logs always looked like this. Each tape arrived with a detailed index of song titles, performer names, places and dates of recordings. You can see here that this piece of paper that's stuck onto another piece of paper, but the original piece of paper is cut to fit inside a seven inch tape reel box. So inside the boxes she had taped what was on the actual tape. And then you can see that perhaps um, they were unstuck from the box and then restuck to this piece of paper um, using the same piece of masking tape. <laughs> Once the tape arrived here, I'm imagining the archivist dealing with it, finding it hard to remove the tape without damaging the paper, and so it was left. Um, at least the content is there, but it provides a wonderful little context. Rubin included wonderful detail, not just in the names and places, but her notes speak to the nature of doing ethnographic field recordings. The note at the bottom here, I'll, I'll read, says, wherever noises are heard on the tape, they are either from traffic, which intruded into the area where taping was taking place, or the restlessness and fidgeting of certain members of the group itself. I often taped in groups because one would stimulate the other's memory. Hearing a song, there would always be someone who would say, I heard it another way, or let me sing it my way. In this way, many variants came to light. Older groups, of course, had a smaller attention span and that's why they were restless. There's another log from the Rubin collection. I found this log to be of particular interest um, because it's of an interview she conducted with her mother in Yiddish. And notice in the notes here what it says about um, her mother, aside from some biographical information, she says, her long life in the New World, however, resulted in her wide use of English terms, so that although her imagery remains, her language has become somewhat contaminated. <laughs> Interesting to see here that Rubin has rather boldly underlined these, these words on, on the log. You look at it and you, you immediately go, go to that underlining. So I'm going to play an excerpt from that first story. See if you can try to hear some of the words that you know Ruben is identifying um, in this. Uh, and if you can't see it there, some of the words are so, law, bunch, front, next door, chickens, yard, and steady. I'll play just a sample of this. The audio starts with the word so. So, uh, the play is the greater gun of a 
En hij was aan gomte gedachter met hem zijn moeder en zijn haar betreffen. Dus eenmaal is papa met meer gevoel in gaan. Met zijn vierde wegel. En als hij keek, die voor van buiten had er gezien, had er voor dat hij in een gooi het veer. En dus hij gewend aan lo, als op een week, ben ik gevoel naar keek, die had er jij dat daar binnen een week. Daar wij daarover. Ja, daar wij daarover. En in het gevoel is hem geprent, met zijn bank. Zoek ze er zeer, wees ze er als meer voor in de front. En dat wees ze als jij een misweging hem daarover. Zoek ze er moesje. Als die is, in die mijn week, wil dat je er haar genen. Ze versteekt zich als moesje, dat je nu niet geven weet. Nou, jij nog niet geweldig geven weet. Je zeer haar op je gongen. En als je nu mijn sloop, die ga je. Is van ze hier gebleven paard. En ze hebben gepremd, dus je weet geen jeft in de rij. Dat is gewoon als je haar niet geven zeer op, want dat is geen geen blind. Dus er gevoel met die gehad hebben, die gehad hebben gevierd van plaats tot plaats. In dezelfde simpel. Als je er weer een populaire gang had, dan van morgen voor zijn dag. Maar de zee zit gewoon het niks daar van die heen. En zei hem gewoon een vervege, twee chickens op hem afmaaien. En hoe zullen ze gewoon steden dat geen dan niet uit een stikken hebben gewoon niet. En als er samen in zijn gang zijn gang te gehad hebben, dan gaat er een land. Als er iets zal zijn steden, waar het met je is leerend. Daar zijn ze. Het leidt alleen maar een leidt met je herst. Maar alleen met je herst. Je weet dat ze zweten. Ze zweten ooit. Ze zeggen in de mensen. Die mensen. Want ze zijn zo zeerend als ze gezocht hebben. Je geert van hem alleen. Je zult zo zijn stilte. Die geven van dat. Maar het herst is geleerd. Het is in stief. Maar eerlijk. Je weet niet dat je even een druis snapt. Of van mij van jaar. Want het is zeer aangesteld. Ze zijn stil. Maar met je herst leren. Ze zijn met je herst leren. Ze zijn met je herst leren. In de mijn taten staat. Oh, mijn taten staat. Ja, mijn zeven. Wie ook de stikken bij. Oh, je hebt niet meer naar de stijl gehoord. Ik denk er dus. Ik heb het gevoel dat de man die doet de stijl, want ik heb gezien. Als er zijn zelfde mensen weet, heb ik die club. Dus is dat geen rechter geweest. Als van, er is het geweest, dus ik ben zo'n prefeer, ik ben een ganger. Maar de regeer is dat er geweest van haar met je herst. One of the final collections I'm going to mention is the Abraham A. Schwadron um, Chaid Gad Yah collection. This collection consists of manuscript materials and sound recordings collected by Schwadron, who's professor of music at UCLA, as part of his 10-year research on the Passover song Chaid Gad Yah. It includes more than 160 versions of the song from around the world in many languages dating from 1973 to 1985. Among the manuscripts are transcri trans transcriptions of some of these versions that he heard or, re or recorded. Um, this example is uh, from a recording that uh, we're going to play made by um, Zola Tisherman, who performs a Yiddish version of Chad Gad Yah. And I'm just going to play the, the first two or so minutes of it. It goes on for <laughs> six or seven <laughs> minutes and gets faster and faster, and he starts thumping along with it, and it's a lot of fun to listen to. But for uh, time constraints, we'll just uh, listen to the first couple of minutes, and uh, I'll let Mr. Tisherman, Tisherman on the recording do the rest of the introduction. I'm Zola Tisherman, and I'm about to do a Yiddish version of Chad Gad Yoh that was taught to me by my dad. The, their version was brought here from Romania, Batashan, Romania. And uh, I remember this as a small boy. We sang, we couldn't wait to get to sing this song at every Seder. Kotat b'shaf na boimala ezo de baralech vaksen and the baralech vil nish vaksen. Kotat b'shaf na meidala zizo de baralech raisen the maiden love will nish the butter love rice and the butter love will nish waxen. Got that by shaf na hintala as all the maiden love bison. The hintala will nish the maiden love bison. The maiden love will nish the butter love rice and the butter love will nish waxen. Got that by shaf na stekala. Er so de hinter le schlugen, 
Der Steckerle will nicht, der Hinterle schlugen, der Hinterle will nicht, der Mädele beißen, der Mädele will nicht, der Badele reißen, und der Badele will nicht wachsen. Gott hat beschaffen nach Feier, er soll der Steckerle brennen, der Feier will nicht, der Steckerle brennen, der Steckerle will nicht, der Mädele Hinter the sugar, hinter the villainish, the maid of the bison, the maid of the villainish, the bottle of rice, and the bottle of villainish box. The final collection that I'm going to make mention of at the Folklife Center, though it's actually one of the largest of all of our Jewish materials, is the Aaron Ziegelman collection. This collection consists of 25 linear feet of manuscripts, more than 2,000 photographs, 276 videos, 160 sound recordings. Uh, most of the videos and sound recordings are oral histories that document the life and traditions in Lebamo, uh, shtetl uh, uh, in Poland, now part of Ukraine, um, whose Jewish community was destroyed um, in World War II. In 1994, the Aaron Ziegelman Foundation initiated the Lebamo Exhibition Project <coughs> to preserve its history and memory. <coughs> Excuse me. The foundation collected photographs, letters, maps, posters, artifacts, and oral histories from more than 100 families and archives around the world. The material was then used in a traveling exhibition called Remembering Labamal, Images of a Jewish Community, that focused on the everyday lives of the Labamal Jews. In addition to the many hours of oral histories in this collection, one of the riches it brings to the center's archive is its contribution of historic photo documentation of Jewish community life and traditions, which historically has also been lacking in the Jewish collections at the American Folklife Center. And that brings me to some thoughts I had uh, when putting this presentation together about the context in which the Henry Sapoznik collection now fits alongside all of these materials and what great addition it is to the center's archive. I mentioned our lack of photographic documentation of Jewish life, and the Sapoznik collection adds more than 70 historic photos that document um, cultural expressions and uh, it, Jewish life. Also, the his, um, <clears throat> among other things, the historic advertisements and transcriptions from the radio programs provide more context and visual documentation that we didn't have um, in our other materials. And lastly, the archive's um, Yiddish sound recordings don't begin until 1947 currently in the, in the archive. So being able to add the voices and cultural expressions of Jewish communities from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s provides a new richness and breadth to the center's Yiddish materials, in particular, the center's archive as a whole and the Library of Congress. That's all I have. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for some questions, and I know we have some mics out in the audience, so uh, we have some right up front here. Do you want to start in the back? That's easier? Go ahead. We'll start in the back. I'm sorry, gentlemen. We'll... Is it on? Oh, yeah. now it's on. Oh, I'm Joel Rubin from the University of Virginia. I just wanted to mention to um, Peggy's wonderful presentation that um, I've done some research in the recorded sound division, which is now, I believe, in Culpeper. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also wonderful resources of commercial 78 recordings in that collection. I'm not sure whether they've been cataloged or not, but the, there's a number of them from pre-World War I Eastern Europe. So that's just another edition of, in the library's collections. Where you you're fortunate because you're at the University of Virginia, and the library's uh, Hewlett-Packard campus is off-site, 75 miles from Washington in Culpeper, Virginia. I've been out there. They've got all the film recordings, all the sound recordings, all the television shows. It's just an amazing facility. And there are actually machines that work 24 hours a day to transfer these materials to more modern means of, of listening to them or looking at them. So it's great that you've used them. And um, you know I hope other people will, will use them as well. It's also possible to order these materials 
into the Library of Congress if you're here for a visit, but you need a week to do that, so think ahead. Okay, we had one right here. Hi, my name is Ira Weiss. I'm representing no one. Um, <laughs> I have a question. I thought someone here might know the answer to this because I've never heard this version of Chad Gad Yah before, the Yiddish Chad Gad Yah that was just played. It's obviously not a translation from the Aramaic because in the Aramaic, uh, the, the, the fire does burn the stick, and in this version, it does not. It refuses to. It's, a, it's an exact translation of a Spanish song called La Chivita. Does anyone know anything about how this came about, this Yiddish version? Because La Chivita in La Chivita, which is exactly like Had Gadya, except the fire doesn't burn the stick, and so on and so forth, it refuses to. This sounds like it was taken from a third source. It is. <laughs> I, I don't have the answer to that, but perhaps in the collection itself where there's a lot of documentation that accompanies these recordings that Abraham Schwadron did, perhaps the answer is, is lurking in there. And so if you want to, you know, get your contact information before you leave, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> we'll go here and then back here. I'm, Mike. I'm Michael Beal. Uh, I had a chance, my daughter and I, to go through the Sam Levinson archive at Brooklyn College. It's difficult because they have absolutely no audio video equipment. I had to bring my own turntable, my own tape recorder, my own movie projector in order to be able to do it. But what we found was something very, very interesting. Now, Sam, of course, he's not a singer, you know, but he you know, did uh, a lot of, of course, uh, monologues in, uh, in both you know, mixed Yiddish and, uh, and English. The records that he made, he made five records. The fifth one is very rare. Uh, four, four sides are basic Yiddish, uh, Yiddish lessons. Uh, those, those are the, uh, the uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth sides. When he started his very prolific broadcasting career in 1950, from that point on, on his broadcasts, he never uttered a word of Yiddish. And well, I, we've, we found, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> we've, we found that very interesting that he, you know, had started a career, uh, both in the Catskill Mountains and going around Brooklyn and on these uh, five records, uh, mixing Yiddish and, and English. But somebody, and it may have been Irving Mansfield, he was his producer on all the TV programs uh, in the early, uh, in his early career, uh, told him, apparently told him, you've got to drop the Yiddish and go 100% English. And from that point on, he was phenomenally successful for five, six, seven years on, uh, on CBS television. Uh, but of, of, uh, th there's one record, uh, he, he rehearsed a lot of the stuff that he eventually recorded on Apollo. And there's one record uh, uh, that he did of the uh, routine called Baby, or New Baby, on the 5th, 78. He did it on one side of the practice uh, lacquer uh, in English, on the other side in Yiddish. And on the label is written by somebody that the English side is better. Huh. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, so, you know, he did not, Although he continued uh, doing private lectures at, uh, at Jewish organizations for the rest of his life, and a lot of those uh, were done in Yiddish, and they're all on tape. Uh, you know, his, his broadcasting career uh, and his public career was only in English after 1950. He was a Spanish teacher. Yes. teacher of Spanish in his high school, and he was five to seven. I think um, Miriam's going to comment. Why don't yeah. we have Miriam comment? Um, it's not surprising. I mean, I was told uh, when I was in college, forget about Yiddish. Uh, it wasn't offered as a language. Uh, there was a lot of pressure. I was told to leave it off my resume. Uh, it would hurt my chances for getting a job. 
you know, so uh, there, the, the weight of the social stigma to this day, you know, I, uh, when I was teaching at the university, half the time when I'd introduce myself, people would say, why aren't you teaching Hebrew? Why are you teaching that language? Is anybody taking it? Why are they taking it? You know, so that's... <laughs> I'm Joshua Rokach. I have a question for David Ryan, if I may. You were talking about the cantorial, history of cantorial presentations, and you said that in 1860 it was basically an uneducated chazan teaching another uneducated chazan. I, in my readings, I noticed that there was influence of the opera on cantorial music and vice versa. In this past century, for instance, Jan Pierce was a chazan and he performed in the opera and Richard Tucker as well. Could you explain how that crept in to the cantorial repertoire, both as substance and also as, recording, as recordings? Jan Pierce was an opera star uh, who I don't think held a cantorial position until later on in his life. Tucker had a, a cantorial post. Um, right. And Tucker, as a child, sang in the choir of Weiser, Samuel Weiser, Fiedel Weiser was his name. So Tucker was a little bit more of a chazan than Pierce. Pierce, for, in the cantorial world, Pierce is considered a good Yiddish singer, n not a uh, serious chazan. However, um, the, the how opera influenced cantorial music and uh, maybe vice versa, um, definitely, I mean, even uh, cantors like Rosenblatt um, uh, were influenced by um, opera. Um, I've read many um, newspaper clippings where uh, on uh, Opera occasions and um, you know shows in in Germany, in Hamburg, and in other places. Rosenblatt was in attendance. Um, the the Jewish um, opera singer Hermann Yadlovka, for those who are familiar, it was a it was very good friends with Rosenblatt, and um, he was a cousin later on as well. But uh, he, you could, certain compositions when you listen to uh, Rosenblatt, you can hear uh, Rossini ideas and other stuff. So yes. When did that? When did that start? Do you know? Um, when the world became a little bit more open, um, as we spoke before, it used to be shtetl to shtetl, and uh, when uh, more Yiddish newspapers came around, when uh, Jewish economy picked up, and uh, when people went to to Sulzer, who was uh, who was a big influence changer in cantorial music, uh, I couldn't get everything that I wanted, but uh, perhaps next time. Um, Sulzer was in Wien, Vienna, and all the big cantors, although he was very mod modern and uh, wasn't a religious, religious cantor, I mean, he was religious, but uh, he, didn't ha he wasn't religious in the musical sense, for sure, and he was definitely influenced by uh, classical music, so uh, it changed. Uh, I, when I listen to a 78 RPM without knowing who it is, I can tell you this is a uh, uh, a Deutsche Oberkante, a, a German Ober, a German cantor. It's definitely not uh, Russian or Polish or even English. It's it's, it's a, so Sulzer had his area, and p even people who were only minimally influenced by him. The professionalism and the fact that they need to know the theory of music well and uh, a certain approach to the cantorial music, definitely he was a big uh, game changer. There was just a gentleman right beyond, right, right, who had his hand up for a while. I just wanted to add one thing in reference to the Chadgadyu that um, if anybody knows um, the translation of Chadgadyu, there's no mention of a girl. <laughs> or a uh, tree. Yeah. Um, it, it's it's uh, it's not that it's not However, I would like to say that even in our household and in many households, 
the concept of a bar appear and a tree and a girl and that you can't reach it is sung in a Yiddish song. So it could be that it got together or maybe there is a tradition to that. I don't know. The Chazanim were influenced by the reform movement. The orthodox cantors were influenced by Sulzer and by Lewandowski. In the recording of the marriage service by Ganshev, which you played, he, he puts a little bit of Lewandowski in there. And a lot of the melodies that are sung today in the Orthodox synagogue came from the reform movement in the 19th century. Hmm. OK. <laughs> I think that Genshoff represents pentatonic music, which is all traditional Jewish music. Uh, da, 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 da. That's not. Uh, that's very traditional pentatonic music, I think. But uh, it could be that he was influenced in some way. They were all influenced. Maybe. Zion, which is sung today, Abba Rachem, which is sung today by everybody. These are reformed. Maybe. Hmm. I, um, I, I wanted to okay, ask. Well, to agree to disagree and move on to another question. <laughs> a, a bit about the uh, process and maybe it's the politics of digitization. Um, with Yiddish books, I know, well, I'm sorry, I presume the Library of Congress is doing some just as part of an overall digitization effort to make things available to people who can't physically be here. Uh, I know the National Yiddish Book Center uh, ha has been busy digitizing uh, their collection of Yiddish books, which is somewhere on the order of 15, 20,000 different titles. And then, uh, if memory serves, Google is busily trying uh, in their grand scheme to digitize everything in the world's uh, seven major libraries. <laughs> and the question is, do you folks interact? Have you, for instance, supported the book center just because uh, what they have represents presumably a sizable portion of the titles you have? Or is everybody... Uh, at least financing themselves, uh, and how much do you talk to each other anyhow? <laughs> well, the library has digitized more than 15 million items out of 130 million items. Uh, one of the primary, um, um, shall I say, um, what is necessary is the library is focused on pre-1923 materials, which are out of copyright restriction. And for foreign materials, uh, I just had some Ladino materials digitized. The library wanted to make sure that they were pre-1870. Uh, so that's really going back very far. We have cooperated in the past. Um, the first. Uh, Jewish women's magazine in the United States, The American Jewess, from 1895. We cooperated with the Jewish Women's Archive, and it was digitized through the University of Michigan. The library also cooperates with the Hati Trust, which is free and available online. You can get all kinds of materials there. Um, we actually tried to claim all the Yiddish materials, Yiddish books that the, were done at the National Yiddish Book Center, and Aaron Lansky said they're out of copyright. If you want to purchase them, that's fine. I mean, we've got all the originals. We have a wonderful collection. So we have not done that. Um, there's a queue, and everyone wants to be at the top of the queue to get his or her materials digitized. So we're working on it. Yiddish sheet music is coming up. Okay, this is the last question, I'm sorry. So go ahead. Um, I'm Sherry Mayer. I just wanted to add a note to the, um, the uh, cantor and opera question. Uh, one of the most interesting um, recordings in my collection that I recently was able to listen to is the European uh, Chazen Gershon Sirota singing an aria from Tosca. And what's really interesting about it is, I mean, he sings it beautifully, but it, his style is not how he sings when he's singing Jewish material. I mean, he sounds like an opera singer. He does not sound like a chazan. And uh, I think the availability of something like that would, um, would be a, a, a very valuable resource for people doing research into that question. 
Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists. It was really a terrific panel. I know I learned a lot. I want to just mention that you might want to take some time to look at the material on display from the Library of Congress during the break, and we'll reconvene at 1120 for the next panel. Shalom Aleichem, Zeit Bagrist. Welcome, everybody. My name is Emmanuel Goldsmith. I'm a retired professor of Yiddish language and literature at Queens College of the City University of New York. I taught there for over 30 years. I also taught at several other universities because my wife says I can't hold a job. <laughs> now I came here, although I'm retired, because I do, since I retired, I do the same things I did before I was retired, I'm just not paid. <laughs> you know what retired means. Tired yesterday, tired today. I'm really here because I couldn't hear about this program without participating in it. I am a product of the Yiddish radio in New York. I spent my life listening to two stations, WEVD and WLIB. More about that later, because if I start talking now, the speakers will not have a chance to speak. Let us begin with Alan Gevinson of the Library of Congress, Packard Campus for Audiovisual Conservation, who will speak on Yiddish radio in Yiddish cinema. Yiddish filmmakers brought to the screen many entertainers who had made names for themselves in other venues especially the stage, but also in Yiddish radio. In turn, Yiddish radio welcomed talent created elsewhere in the concert halls, on the stage, and also in films. The link between Yiddish radio and Yiddish cinema that I wish to focus on is not this kind of cross-fertilization and exploitation, though it is important and I'll make note of it where appropriate. I want instead to examine ways in which, Yiddish, in which Yiddish radio was depicted in Yiddish films. Popular culture productions like radio shows and movies have been mined by scholars for the clues they might offer about the times in which they were created, clues that can supplement and even challenge interpretations based on evidence from other sources. You can always take the pulse of a time by studying its second-rate arts, the cartoonist and playwright Jules Pfeiffer has written. Its Western crime movies, radio and TV shows, its true love magazines, its comic books, they are all close approximations of the fantasy life of the lowest common denominator. To know the true temper of a nation's people, Pfeiffer concluded, turn not to its sociologists, turn to its junk. <laughs> we will soon, soon turn to clips from three popular Yiddish films considered at the time of their release to be junk, or shund, a Yiddish word for trash, a term that scholars have applied critically but also affectionately to a large genre in Yiddish theater and Yiddish films. First, I'll give a brief introduction to Yiddish cinema in general and to the ongoing effort to preserve it for posterity in which the Library of Congress has been involved. Yiddish films were produced primarily in three places, Warsaw, Moscow, and New York, most prolifically in New York. More than 140 short subjects and feature-length films were made, nearly all of them between 1911 and 1940. Most had theatrical releases in major cities, Many had an afterlife playing for years in synagogues, Jewish community centers, and schools. Some starred great actors of the Yiddish stage. Some were based on works by renowned Yiddish authors and playwrights. Most were made on less than shoestring budgets. Jay Hoberman, in his acclaimed study of Yiddish cinema, Bridge of Light, has identified five distinct phases in this history. From 1911 to World War I, Yiddish film production was centered in War Warsaw, but New York's Yiddish theater provided much of the source material for the films. From 1917 through the end of the silent film era, the end of the 1920s, 
There were ambitious, though sporadic, attempts to produce Yiddish films in Austria, Poland, and the Soviet Union, drawing on the works of Yiddish and Jewish novelists. These were progressive, youth-oriented, and sometimes controversial films, influenced by currents of symbolism, expressionism, futurism, and communism. Only half a dozen examples from this period have survived, some only in fragmentary form. In the early sound, period, sound film period of 1929 to 1934, some 20 feature-length Yiddish films and as many short subjects were produced, nearly all of them in, in the United States. Hoberman cites two major achievements of this period, the films Uncle, Uncle Moses made in New York and The Return of Nathan Becker, a Soviet film. The fourth period, 1935 to 1940, has, become, has come to be known as the golden age of Yiddish cinema. It began with a rejuvenation of the Polish film industry that allowed what Hoberman characterizes as an ongoing dialogue between Warsaw and New York, resulting in co-productions and exchanges of talent. International hits produced during the golden age include Yiddel with his fiddle, Greenfields, Tevia, and the Divik. Following World War II, attempts to revive Yiddish cinema were made in Poland, Israel, and the US, efforts that resulted in the production of only a few films. A much more successful renaissance began in the mid-1970s when a concerted effort was undertaken to, to locate surviving negatives and prints from the Yiddish films that had been made previously and to preserve them for future generations. In 1974, the Jewish Media Service, a Boston area-based arm of the National Center of Jewish Federations, undertook a worldwide search for these films, nearly all of which had been made with unstable nitrate film stock, which is highly inflammable and prone to decompose over time into a powder or goo. Also in 1974, the most prolific of Yiddish filmmakers, Joseph Seiden, died. Active as a producer and director since 1929, Seiden also had become the major distributor of Yiddish films. His collection totaled 31 films, some of which were sole surviving copies. In 1976, with funds raised by the Jewish Media Service from private individuals, the American Jewish Historical Society acquired the Seiden collection. The next year, the society transferred all the nitrate from the collection and some of the acetate or safety film based materials to the Library of Congress in a gift agreement. The library since then has made duplicate acetate based prints of these materials for preservation purposes. In 1976, the Jewish Media Service reorganized as the National Center for Jewish Film. The center continued its search for surviving material and raised funds to restore Yiddish films and distribute them in 35 millimeter prints to theaters and film festivals, but more commonly on videotape and DVD for institutional and home use. To date, they have restored 41 Yiddish feature length films, three Yiddish feature length documentaries, and 13 short subjects. You can find National Center for Jewish Film flyers on the table at the back of the room. They include information for those interested in becoming donors. Soviet Yiddish films often focused on czarist oppression. Yiddish films made in Poland drew on Hasidic folklore. In the United States, family melodramas predominated, many haunted, in J. Hoberman's words, by a profound uneasiness. He explains, with their images of psychic and domestic disintegration, of unhappy upward mobility, of Americanized children rejecting, abandoning, or otherwise being lost to the parents who have suffered and sacrificed for them, such films dramatized the anxieties of recent immigrants, the disruptive effect that the new world had on traditional values. This theme is com common among writers on Yiddish cinema that the road to modernity took Jewish immigrants and especially their children away from a hallowed romanticized home whose values and traditions, especially those of the Jewish religion, thus were threatened with extinction. 
juxtaposition of a variety of disparate elements was common to Schund, a genre that theater historian Nachma Sandro characterizes as an art form, the first, she states, to express the distinctively American Yiddish community. Sandra writes, Schund freely mixes everything, classical Yiddish songs, topical jokes, pilfered dialogue, irrelevant new show tunes. As a prime example of Shund, the film Kol Nidre intertwines its domestic melodrama with comic interludes by Yeda Zwirling and David Liederman, whom you just saw, a song by radio cantor Liebeli Waldman, a sermon by a rabbi illustrated with clips from old biblical films, and a chilling ballad by radio poet Chaim Tabor about a father who kills his daughter to protect her from a Cossack light soldier, a scene that includes clips from another old film. Although the term shund originally was meant as an insult, Sandro observes, it can have energy, theatricality, flair, flashes of art and wit. The literary critic Irving Howe has commented, whatever else shund may have been, it was not escapist in any obvious sense. It drove right to the center of the Jewish heart. Kol Nidre is an example also of the dialogue between Warsaw and New York that Hoberman wrote about. The madcap Yetta Zwirling, as the New York Times referred to her, honed her comic talents in numerous American Yiddish stage, pr stage productions before of appearing at eight Yiddish films in the late 1930s. Her partner in the marital scene was Polish actor David Liederman, who came to New York earlier in 1939 with a Yiddish cabaret troupe from Warsaw that toured the eastern U.S. and Chicago. Lily Liliana, who played the daughter in the first clip, also was a member of the troupe, while the actors portraying her parents were from the American Yiddish stage. Fortunately, most of the troupe were still in the U.S. when Germany invaded Poland, just six days before the premiere of Kol Nidre. In the film The Cantor Son, made in 1937, radio also was symbolic of the conflict between the traditional and the modern. Jay Hoberman has called the film an anti-jazz singer. The Al Jolson film he references played a key role in the history of cinema as a catalyst for the transition from silent to sound films. But the film also was key for its depiction of conflicts within Jewish immigrant families and within individuals faced with assimilation into the American mainstream culture. The protagonist of The Canter Son, unlike the Jolson character, ultimately rejects celebrity life and returns to his ancestral roots. The film transposes the beginning of the jazz singer from the Lower East Side ghetto to an Eastern European shtetl where a canner son leaves home, as the Jolson character did, to join a traveling company of performers. They eventually arrive in America, but there the son struggles to find work, ending up as a janitor in a nightclub until his talent is discovered by a female entertainer, also as in the jazz singer. The review in Variety characterized the film as shunned without using the term. This is one of the trashiest stories put to Put to the emulsion, it began. It is a confusion of exaggerated drama, Yiddish jazz, frantic comedy, and cantoric chant. The reviewer, however, demonstrated an understanding of popular taste similar to that of Rozovich as he continued. But it's the stuff which, peculiarly enough, makes for surefire box office in the Yiddish theater. On that premise, the picture should attract excellent Yiddish patronage, is the great advisor. Released in December 1940, one of the last Yiddish films made before the US entered the war. Because the Library of Congress does not own a soundtrack for the film, this clip digitized from the picture element will be silent, but we have added in English language subtitles that were found on a separate reel. The clip shows divergent perspectives on ways that audience members might have reacted to Yiddish radio.
This is David the Trouble Fixer. He may have been a caricature of radio personality C. Israel Lutsky, known as the Jewish philosopher who read letters on the air and gave advice to listeners daily from 1931 to the mid-1960s. Lutsky's appearance, as described in Henry Sapoznik's Yiddish Radio Project website, matches David's, short, pugnacious, and dapper to the point of risibility, an entertainer above all else. Charlatan or sage, as the Yiddish Radio Project describes him, Lutsky was one of the most beloved and listened to figures from the golden age of radio, of Yiddish radio. The actor playing David is Irving Jacobson, a veteran comic actor of the Yiddish stage who also became a producer, director, and Yiddish theater owner. In the 1960s, he gained fame in mainstream theater for originating the role of Sancho Panza on Broadway in the musical The Man of La Mancha. Publicity for the great advisor noted, the producers feel that the world sorely needs more laughter and we therefore modeled this feature on the type of film produced by the Marx Brothers. The farce portrays David as a type of con man that Groucho Marx made famous and involves him in a zany plot filled with a host of characters engaged in a host of con games. Radio in this film does not carry the same symbolic significance that it has in Kol Nidre as a cultural marker of a modernity that disrupts traditional life. The Great Advisor is closer in its depiction on, of radio to the Cantor Sun, which uses Yiddish radio to satirize the crassness of modern consumer culture, but also valorizes it as an effective modern way to communicate to a large immigrant audience the power and beauty of the Cantor's voice. In The Great Advisor, the Yiddish radio personality is defined by its listeners. David the Trouble Fixer is mocked as David the Faker by the young women playing Mahjong, but he also has become a dear friend to this very romantic girl in earnest search of a match. In these films, Yiddish radio, like Yiddish film, functions as a modern institution that has become, for better or worse, an integral part of everyday life for a Jew Jewish community positioned uneasily on the divide between the traditional and the modern. No questions in that, do we? That's it, thank you. Press, theater, literature, music, art, all of these go to make Yiddishland. Our next speaker, Itzik Adesman, is a contributor and an associate editor of the Forwards. Our program says Jewish Daily Forward. That's an English newspaper. <laughs> Professor Gass, are you the editor of both? No, but it, the Yiddish is known also as the Daily News. I know, that's the, that's the problem. <laughs> he is also the author, author of a very important book about Yiddish, Defining the Yiddish Nation, one of the best books we have about the Yiddish world. It's a goddessman. <laughs> Yiddish radio and the Yiddish press. <clears throat> I want to first express my thanks for being invited to this conference that honors Henry Sapoznik for his pioneering Yiddish radio research. Thanks to his work, at least some of the ephemeral world of Yiddish radio in America has been saved. As we have heard, Yiddish radio was an incredibly creative field with talk shows, talent shows, quiz shows, soap operas, religious and music, political programs, and music, music, music. We are so fortunate that Henry Sapoznik has rescued, preserved, and now donated these recordings and other materials to the Library of Congress, materials that tell us so much about the Jewish immigrant experience, specifically about the rich Yiddish cultural world in America in a unique and expressive form. A story in our family tells how one of our relatives in a shtetl in Romania heard a radio for the first time at someone's house. Believing that there was a tiny, all-knowing man inside, he inquired, would you please ask him the current value of wheat? 
referring to his invested shares in the stock market, the Berze. I have no doubt that variants of this anecdote appear in many languages and cultures, so, and maybe it's no surprise that the Yiddish version relates to the stock market. <laughs> Similar jokes or, or Yiddish stories were created after every new heretical invention appeared among the Jews in Eastern Europe, the telegraph, the railroad, the Luftballon, the Zeppelin. But broadcast radio was not a 19th century invention like these others, but was rather a latecomer appearing after the First World War. And as we heard yesterday, Yiddish radio was truly developed and expanded in America. The Dybbuk radio spirit that the shtetl Jew heard was perhaps an old world exception. And more commonly, the intimate voice of the radio was quickly accepted and made part of the American Jewish family. The Yiddish newspaper in America was also part of the American Jewish family experience and played a major role in Jewish immigrant life. The two cultural institutions were intertwined from the beginning of radio, as we've heard yesterday and we hear today. The Yiddish Forvitz newspaper, also commonly known as the Jew Jewish Daily Forward, founded in 1897, where I am currently an editor, certainly played an important part in Yiddish radio history, particularly through its powerful radio station, WEVD, founded in 1927 and named after the socialist candidate for president, Eugene V. Debs, who had died in 1926. I joined the paper in the year 2000 and soon added my voice to the Yiddish Forward Radio Hour with weekly reviews of new Yiddish song and klezmer recordings. Until, two, until 2006 or so, the Yiddish Forward Hour programs were still transmitted over the radio. But in, this, in the six years that I broadcast on the Yiddish Forward Hour, I saw the amazing outreach possibilities of Yiddish radio even in the 21st century outreach possibilities that the secular Yiddish press could not achieve. <coughs> Once when I was checking out at a cashier at B&H photo store in a large Hasidic run store in Manhattan, the Hasidic cashier saw my name on the credit card and imitated in jest my radio line, Dos et geretzen ach it's a gottesman. <laughs> this was speaking to you, it's a gottesman. <laughs> Later, meeting with other Hasidic Jews in Brooklyn, I realized that I had sort of a following among them. But, and this is important, they knew me only from the radio show, not from the newspaper. Since the Forvitz had originally been a socialist paper, it has remained taboo, a paper for non-believers, upper Corsum, among the very orthodox. So even today, they still think it's a socialist paper, though truth be told, the Forvitz has not been aligned with the Socialist Party since the 1930s when editor Abe Kahn supported FDR for president and broke with the party. The paper did continue to have strong ties to the unions, particularly to the garment industry through the 1970s, and had a labor editor into the 1980s. But it also has, and still has, a Parsha of the Week column, a Torah column, since the early 50s, an idea introduced by Abe Kahn himself, the founding editor. And the paper included other columns, material directed at the more religious. But too late, once the paper was stigmatized by the Orthodox, it remained off limits. So today's Hasidic Jews will not be seen buying or reading the paper, but they do listen to the Yiddish radio of the taboo forward in the privacy of their own homes. I get phone calls in the forward office from Jews in Williamsburg. So where can I listen to more Aaron Lebedev, more Pesach Geburstein, two great singers and actors of the Yiddish stage? The Jewish world often looks to the Hasidim as the authentic Jews. But it also happens that today's Hasidic Jews look for authenticity in aspects of secular Yiddish culture learned about on the radio. Another example of the outreach power of Yiddish radio as opposed to the Yiddish press is the large Jewish population in New York, the large population in New York of the Russian Jews. The Yiddish radio, and to some degree the Yiddish theater, can reach them in a way the Yiddish press cannot. In the Soviet Union, Yiddish culture had been suppressed beginning in the 1930s, and Jews who grew up there in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s were not taught how to read the Yiddish alphabet. Yiddish culture thereby developed into an oral culture, parents speaking Yiddish to their children, but not reading them any Yiddish texts. <coughs> so many older Russian Jews in New York can understand Yiddish quite well, speak Yiddish less well, and read Yiddish hardly at all. For this audience, Yiddish radio is ideal and is a strong emotional bind to the culture of their parents and grandparents in the old country. 
Henry told you the classic description of how the forward hour would be heard through every window in a Jewish neighborhood in the 1930s and 40s. New York Russian Jews have told me that at, as the time of the broadcast of the Yiddish forward hour approached each week, every family in an apartment building would return to their apartments to listen. And this, was about this was about 2003. The golden age of the Yiddish radio, 1930s and 40s, was a little later than the other golden ages of Yiddish culture unless someday we will call this decade the golden age of Yiddish internet. <laughs> the golden age of Yiddish theater was before the 1920s, though, as was pointed out, Yiddish theater helped the Yiddish, Yiddish radio helped the Yiddish theater very much during the 30s and 40s. When Yiddish radio began in the 1920s, the Yiddish press was at the end of its golden era. The Forovitz had 300,000 readers in the second decade of the century. By 1953, that was down to 90,000. The new Im newly imposed limitation of immigrants to the US in 1924 and the depression were external factors in this decline. The rapid assimila assimilation of the Jews, particularly linguistically, was an internal one. Though Jews are known for their high literacy rates and strong tradition of reading, and I saw a sign today is National Literacy Day, I think, these qualities transferred over to the English language after the first generation of Jewish immigrants. The Yiddish press in America began really in 1870. Though it is thought that there was no Yiddish culture before the East European Jewish immigrants of the 1880s to 1920s, in fact, in 1870, there were enough Yiddish speakers to publish the newspaper, the Yiddish at Sight. Five Yiddish newspapers were published in New York and Chicago during the 1870s, and even more in the 1880s, most of them weeklies. As the Jewish labor movement developed in the 1880s and 1890s, Newspapers were printed for the Jewish workers with a socialist, anarchist, or progressive viewpoint. Other papers, such as the Tagblatt, were for the more conservative religious Jews. During yesterday's questions, someone marveled how the Internationale was incorporated into the concluding song of the socialist forward hour. Some things that we today only associate with communism were shared by all the Jewish progressive radical movements. The Internationale was sung by all of secular progressive Yiddish culture. The Yiddish poet David Edelstadt, an anarchist, sings about the red flag in his poems of the 1880s. Through the 1930s, May Day, May 1st, was celebrated by all the Folkschul movements, the Socialist Workmen's Circle, the Zionist Farbanschulm, the non-political but liberal Shalm Aleichem Shulm, and the Communist Orden Shulm. By the time Yiddish radio came on the scene in the late 1920s, there were five daily Yiddish papers in New York City. Two of them were orthodox conservative papers, Das Yiddische Tagblatt and the Morgenjournal, which merged in 1928 into the Morgenjournal, so there were really four by 1928. The Morgenjournal was founded by Yankiv Saperstein from Bialystok in 1901 to compete with the Tagblatt, and the two coexisted for almost 30 years. Peretz Viernik was the first editor. Dalit Lamed Meckler was the second editor. These, paper, these papers were openly against socialism, not against the worker, supported traditional Judaism, and Saperstein even got involved in New York rabbinic politics as well. He was close to the Republican Party, and President Taft visited him. It had, I, as far as I can see, it had no radio program. Another daily Yiddish paper at the time was the communist Freiheit. At the end of 1918, socialist Jewish groups inspired by the Bolshevik Revolution broke off from the Socialist Federation and formed an opposition. The Communist Workers' Party was founded in 1921, and the Yiddish paper, the Freiheit, appeared April 2, 1922. In every socialist Jewish organization, from the workmen's circle to the unions, divisive splits uh, developed. In fact, the socialist Jewish world pretty much split in half. I can tell a family story <laughs> here about my father-in-law went to Kindering um, on, in uh, Sylvan, Sylvan Lake. And when the split happened, uh, half the camp founded Kinderland on the other side of the same lake. <laughs> and uh, my father-in-law, Al, was very curious what was going on in Kinderland. So he took a canoe, and <laughs> by the way, Tzvi Schuller was his uh, theater, uh, was the theater counselor at Art and Circle Lodge that summer. Uh, so K 
Kinderland saw his canoe approaching, and they quickly uh, created this huge uh, greeting for him. It became a symbolic event that someone from Kindering was going over to Kinderland, even though he was just, he was just 12 or 13. Um, and when he got out of the canoe, they lifted him up, and they, they carried him around, and he was a big hero. And he was uh, asked to leave that same day from, from Kindering. <coughs> So it was a very divisive split. <laughs> the Freiheit drew from a loyal readership and also developed an important literary side, thanks to its editor Mem Olgin and the literary editor Schachne Epstein. The communist Yiddish literary group Protelpen was created thanks to the Freiheit. And the Yiddish Ordenschule and the camps, the choirs, the clubs were very much helped by the Freiheit's leadership. In 1929, the Freiheit became a morning paper and changed its name to Morgen Freiheit. The Freiheit followed the Soviet party line even when it cost it much of its readership, as when it shockingly condoned the Arab attacks on Jews in Israel in 1929 and supported the Hitler-Stalin Pact of 1939. The Tug, the fifth daily in the late 20s, began publishing October 1914. They had at least one reader. <laughs> <laughs> With the editor, Hermann Bernstein. Bernstein was a columnist at the New York Times at the time, so the announcement of him as editor was a curious one, but it turned out to be a good one. As Henry mentioned yesterday, the Tog actually had the first regular Yiddish radio show. The paper called itself, quote, Umapengik, Umparteish, Rein, Interessant, und Literarisch. <laughs> Independent, apolitical, clean, interesting, and literary. Which I think can be interpreted as an anti forwards uh, description. The idea, Zionist. And, and Zionist. Okay. Zionist. Yeah. the idea of a politically neutral independent newspaper was a new one to a Yiddish world used to political party fighting and strong ideological feelings. The emphasis of the tug was on culture, general culture and Jewish culture, so the best Yiddish writers were drawn to it. They were probably also drawn to the tug as well because the editor-in-chief of the Forvitz, Abe Khan, Ab Khan, notoriously dummy downed the Yiddish language of the writers and treated them with little respect. If you saw the film On the Forward by, made by Marlene Booth, there's a scene in which I.B. Singer says that uh, whenever he saw that they, they sort of simplified his Yiddish language, he complained to Khan and Khan would say, talk to the, ask the elevator uh, guy if he knows that word. Of course, the elevator guy knew that if he wanted to keep his job, he'd have to say, no, I never heard of the word. Um, at the Forward Office now in New York, we have an exhibit on Ab Khan that includes a telegraph correspondence he had with the Yiddish novelist I.J. Singer, I.B. Singer's brother, in which Khan is trying to influence the ending of songs of Singer's classical novel, The Family Karnofsky. Yiddish writers hated Khan, but he, hate, but he paid the highest salary, so they had to restrain themselves. Um, one of the most moving documents I saw at YIVO was a correspondence between the great modernist writer Dovid Bergelson, who was in Berlin at the time, with Kahn, really uh, uh, flattering Kahn to a ridiculous degree, trying to, because this was Berlin in the 20s where the depression was, you know, money was worth nothing, trying to get some articles printed uh, in the forward. So it was begging Kahn, this is, and Bergelson is like the great fiction writer of the 20th century. The Tug merged with the Morgenjournal in the 1950s and became the Tug Morgenjournal. So by the 50s, there were three Yiddish dailies, the Morgenfreiheit, the Vorwitz, and the Tug Morgenjournal. All three, were all three were daily up to the 1960s. The Tug closed in 1971, and the Algemeine Journal, still printed weekly, has tried to continue its tradition, but now I think only four pages are in Yiddish. Today, there are no Yiddish dailies in America, just the weekly Vorwärts, the Allgemeiner, and in the Hasidic world, the Satmar, Yid, and Blatt, and other no newspapers that come and go. Thanks to the lack of internet, perhaps, in much of the Satmar community, and an abundance of ads for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and other simchas in a community that has many, many children, Scheitels. and shaitels, these two Satmar newspapers are quite successful while the rest of the newspapers in the world, not just the Yiddish ones, as I'm sure you per have heard, are closing or going online. <clears throat> Back to history. Uh, after the anarchist daily, 
the Wahrheit, the truth, merged with the Tug in 1918. So it was the Wahrheit and the Tug, then they, and the Morgen with the Tagblatt, and then they became, the, they kept merging and merging. Uh, so the anarchist Yiddish press was represented by the fortnightly Freie Arbeiterstimme, the free voice of labor, which continued into the 1980s. Again, I don't believe the Yiddish anarchist press ever had a Yiddish radio show. And, they, and neither did the Morgen Journal, um, the Tug did. I don't believe that the often nasty partisanship that was expressed in regards to the Yiddish press, uh, in regard, let's say, to what paper you were reading, carried over into the Yiddish radio. Henry pointed out yesterday that the communist Freiheit developed their own radio shows rather late in the game, in the 1940s. And even then, just one or two shows, perhaps. When you ask the older generation of former Yiddish communists what they listen to, they say WEVD, the Forward Hour, and other stations. This parallels, from the other side of the spectrum, the observation made before about Hasidim listening to the forward but not buying the paper. The communist Yiddish world hated the forward very much, but they listened to their radio station, WEVD. I should also mention that in smaller cities, Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Yiddish press and, and Yiddish radio did, in fact, uh, work together to have shows. I wanted to conclude. Um, by describing the state of Yiddish radio programming today, which Mark David started, or started doing a comment yesterday. As a Yiddishist, I don't like to, we don't like to talk about Yiddish only in the past tense. Um, and in, so I want to present for a minute what's going on today. In New York, the Yiddish Forward Hour, the old program produced by the Yiddish Forward newspaper since the 19, early 30s, is no longer transmitted via radio waves, but as a podcast. Since many of our readers and listeners are in their 80s and 90s and don't have computers, the Forward sends them CDs of the show every week. The Forward Hour is hosted and conducted in Yiddish, and there are some radio shows that are called Yiddish radio shows, but are half English, half Yiddish, but certainly play Yiddish music. One of them is in Portland with Jack Falk, hosts for many years, starting in 1979, on WKBOO 90.7 FM. Um, it's called the Yiddish Hour. In Boston, the one-hour show Das Yiddische Kull is broadcast every Wednesday from 7.30 to 8.30 on WUNRAM, produced and hosted in Yiddish by Mark David. And David has produced many great Yiddish personalities, writers, and actors who have already passed on, so the archive of past programs is a treasure. Elsewhere in North America, Rochelle Zucker produces a Winnipeg Jewish Radio Hour every week. The second half is in Yiddish. Uh, unfortunately, a long-running show started in 1962 in Montreal, ceased a few years ago when its host, Nochem Vilcheski, died in 2009. Around the world, there are radio shows hosted in Yiddish in, in Copenhagen, Warsaw, that might have just closed, uh, in Paris, in Melbourne, in Argentina, in Kashinev, Moldova. In Israel, the Israel Broadcasting Authority has been broadcasting the Yiddish program Kol Yisrael more than 60 years. The only Yiddish program on the radio in New York City, I think, is from the Yiddish-speaking Hasidic or Yeshiva world. These programs come and go. The Chabad organization has a one-hour program, an interpretation of the Torah or Talmud reading. And Henry mentioned this also. It's on WMCA, a Christian station that becomes Jewish Saturday night. Um, the forward hour was transmitted on that station at 9 o'clock on Saturday, which, as you realize, is, not, is still Shabbos, for several months of the year. So we were the sh basically, th we were the only ones who would take that slot. So we were pretty much the Shabbos Goyim of the Yiddish <laughs> radio. <coughs> Shabbos Jews, Goyim. Um, that's my presentation. I wanted to, I wanted to answer a question from yesterday. Because <laughs> uh, I think two people asked about the, di the Yiddish dialect on the radio. And, so, and the film clips that were shown also reinforce, uh, it's not uh, a Hefker world. There is a Yiddish theater dialect. Um, it developed from early on, from the Goldfaden troupe. It was a compromise, basically, of several dialects. It's called the Volina dialect. Um, if you listen, instead of gut, they said git. Uh, instead of sometimes in that movie, the movie clips, instead of laich, they said lach. Uh, jeden, instead of jeden. Um, I was in the Yiddish theater one, uh, one year, uh, Tzvi Schooler, whose name keeps coming up, 
who's a Litvak, but he was actually the one making sure that people said git instead of good. He was sort of the uh, one at the side of the stage telling us to correct ourselves. Um, so in fact, there is a uh, Yiddish theater dialect. I, it's not 100%. When a narrator speaks in Klal Yiddish, that's sort of more acceptable because it's sort of an authoritarian, you know, they're, they're, but when you have a Stuchkov drama, which we're going to hear about soon, and it's supposed to depict real life, Yiddish theater sort of determined, well, you can't speak you can't not speak a dialect on the stage. It sounds really phony. And so a, an actual theater dialect uh, was agreed upon. However, in the Soviet Union, Mikhail's theater actually went for the higher road uh, and speaks pretty much general non-dialect standard Yiddish, which works in a, a play, let's say, like Ye King Lear in Yiddish, which is already about a king and an aristocratic family, but it doesn't work when you're Shimala Sadaka, a Shalom Aleichem story, it, it doesn't quite work. Thank you very much. And on Yiddish radio, everybody calls Judaism Yiddishkeit, except the singer Simo Retzai, <laughs> who always said Yiddishkeit. <laughs> Our next speaker, Matthew Barton, is the curator of recorded sound in the Library of Congress Packard Center for Audiovisual. Conservation. Can you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> it's on my card, so <laughs> that makes it easier. And he's going to speak about Yiddish culture and mainstream radio's golden age. <laughs> I, don't, I never talk to two microphones like that, I, but I gather you need to be careful about your percussive P's uh, when you're doing this. Um, so my title, is Yiddish culture and mainstream radio's golden age. And it occurred to me this morning that that could be the title of an extremely thin book. <laughs> uh, because although there were many successful Jewish entertainers on the radio from Jack Benny on down, uh, there was very little Yiddish culture. Uh, that is literature, theater, music, uh, very little of that got onto mainstream radio. And by mainstream radio, I mean national radio network radio. However, over the years, once in a while, something got on. And, um, uh, but I'll start with uh, a clip from 1937. If we can get this to work. Yay. Um, a clip from 19, uh, actually 1939, sorry. Um, Sam Schlepperman Hearn. And this is uh, a character like Schlepperman who he created for the Jack Benny show. Uh, you know, was, that was the, probably the typical representation of, of uh, the Yiddish uh, community, Yiddish culture, and on, on the radio at that time. He predates Mrs. Nussbaum of Allen's Alley by many years. Uh, he had a brother named Lou Hearn, who was in the same business of dialect uh, comedy. Um, they were Jewish, uh, from New York, and uh, very active in um, uh, vaudeville and Broadway. Uh, as you'll hear, though, Sam Hearn did more than just uh, Yiddish dialect uh, uh, comedy. So let's uh, let's hear this from 1939 on George Jessel's Vitalis show. Benny. Well, I did, I did. I built myself a nice little chattel. You you built a, you built a what? A chattel, a chattel. You know, like they have in the Switzerland, in the Alps, in the peaks up there. Only a hoo, only a hoo. I see. Yeah. <laughs> they should have cough drops up there too. But how? I don't understand that. Settle. How do you spell it? Uh, never mind. It's a bungalow. All oh, right. <laughs> now, I'll bet you have a very cute place. Oh, Georgia, you should see it. What a swanky joint. What mm. kind of installation do you use throughout your house? Central unit or diesel? Just plain hot and cold water. Oh, I see. <laughs> Georgia, you should see it. It's got some very fancy features. Fancy features? Yes. A built-in bathtub. Built-in? Yes, built in 1898. Oh. <laughs> And also, it's got a hidden fireplace. A hidden fireplace? Yes, I'm living there six months, and I still can't find it. <laughs> anyway, Schlepp, one thing you got out of working for Benny is a house. That's right. And one more season with him, and I could have bought a teapot. <laughs> but like Shakespeare said, all the world's a stooge, and so I'm here. Yes. Now, what are you doing in town, Schlepp? I came to see the World Series. The World Series? <laughs> that was over two weeks ago. Oh, no wonder they sold me a ticket for a quarter. 
Why don't you wait until the middle of January and see the World's Fair, Schlepp? Hey, I'm glad you reminded me, because there's one thing I'm very anxious to see there. Uh, what's that? The pyre and the telescope. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> No, you mean the trailer fair and the church, the, the film, that's what you mean. Ah, oh, you took the words right out of my mouth. Well, at least you're here in time for the football games. Football games? Well, that's silly. They finished last summer. No, Schlepp, you have your seasons mixed up. You could see some great football games here tomorrow. I can? Well, Georgie boy, when you talk football, my heart belongs to Daddy. Yeah. Fancy this, my pal. Please, please, don't be an echo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Slep. It's so seldom that I hear such a quaint accent that it fascinates me. Yeah, the feeling is mutual. Oh, you think so, is it? Yeah. <laughs> now, look. Here's two tickets for tomorrow's game. You come with me. We'll get a great kick listening to the crowd's cheer. Oh, you touched me that time, honey boy, because I was once a cheerleader, too. Well, what was your favorite college cheer? Should I quote it for Bagel? Yeah, for Bagel, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Cheer away. Okay. Ra, ra, ra. Says Bumba. Slip him in his finest so is his pa, whose store is open from 8 to 7 with suits $22 up or down. <laughs> the two pair of pants, you go to town, satisfaction guaranteed, but a belt in the back, walk up, one flag, don't fall in the crack, closed on Sunday except February, which has 28. Yeah, 18! <laughs> Sam, now seriously, how long have you been schlepping this Schlepperman character around? Five years, George. Five years? And what sort of a thing did you play before that? Well, I did a New England character called Lem Perkins. Lem Perkins? What sort of character was he? Well, George, he used to talk like this. Now, he was a kind of a fella. He used to come to the city and give the slicker two tens for a five. I see. <laughs> well, that's what I call a drastic change from Schlepperman to Perkins and certainly demonstrate the most amazing versatility. Well, versatility, hospitality, whatever you call it, I gotta make a train. Oh. I think I'll sing something. Somewhere over the rainbow I must fly I hope I'll be back on this program by and by when the midnight to Tulis for Alabama, I got the blues. Wah, 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 wah. So long, stranger. So long, Sam, and I hope to see you again soon. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, he leaves you breathless, doesn't he? <laughs> uh, from a little earlier in the 30s, 1936, uh, Edwin, uh, like George Jessel, a Jewish comedian, uh, had on his uh, show Joseph Moskowitz, the great uh, cymbalum virtuoso, who had, at that point had been entertaining in New York for close to 30 years. He owned a series of restaurants on the, um, uh, the east side uh, and was uh, quite well known, got to uh, record for Victor. That's from the Victor catalog of 1916. And um, he even pops up in Mike Gold's book, Jews Without Money. Uh, the um, only national radio appearance I know of by him is this, from 1936. And uh, as, as you'll hear, it sounds as though Ed Wynn had, had heard him at least once in his uh, restaurant in New York and brought him on the show on the strength of that. Uh, say, Mr. Moskowitz, yes. this symbol is very old and unusual instrument, isn't it? Yes, uh, but it's still used today in Hungarian, it's Romanian. Mm -hmm. ah. The symbol um, I use dates back to the 17th century. Your symbol dates back to the 17th century? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness, it should be nearly paid for by <laughs> now, for heaven's <laughs> sake. 17th century. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Moskowitz, have yes. you always been a concert musician? No, after coming to this country, I opened my own restaurant. Many famous people came to hear me play. Mm -hmm. For instance, Michel Elman, Charlie Chaplin, Theodor Dreiser, Tasha Seidel. Tasha Seidel? The musician, Tasha Seidel? <laughs> that name always reminds me of somebody ordering beer. Tasha Seidel, you know what I mean. I... You know, a friend of mine used to play the cymbals. You know the cymbals in a band? Not the cymbal, the cymbals. He, he played the cymbals until uh, 1929. <laughs> then came the crash. You know what I mean? <laughs> Well, I know everybody wants to hear you play the cymbal, and I'd like you to play your own composition like you did for me the night I played stage, Mr. Moskowitz. Would you do that? Yeah, very well. I will play it, too. I will play a two oriental movement composed for my own Yeah, well, come over here and play them. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Let me hear them. Let me hear them. <laughs> Graham, where did you hear this fella? He is, he's the greatest cymbal player in the world. Where did you hear him? I'm going to listen. <laughs> 
Joseph Moskowitz, uh, who ended his career here in Washington, D.C., spent the last 10 years of his life here, died in 1954, and uh, uh, apparently was the, uh, the regular musical entertainment at a restaurant in DuPont Circle. I wish, wish we all could have been there, I'm sure. Uh, so, moving ahead, uh, the Rudy Valley Show, which was uh, enormously popular in the 30s and 40s. Rudy Valley is not particularly well-remembered uh, nowadays. He was a, a very popular uh, crooner of the day, and uh, he had exceptionally broad taste when it came to the musical guests on his show. He had Trinidadian Calypso singers. Louis Armstrong served as a guest host one summer, and uh, at least once he had Molly Pican on the show, and this was at the end of an international tour she had done, spent about 18 months overseas, uh, getting, you know, uh, going to Africa, to Ireland, as you'll hear, and many other places. Um, <clears throat> you're not going to hear her uh, speak or sing any Yiddish. Uh, I, I think this is, what you'll hear is representative of what she did uh, for mixed audiences or non-Jewish audiences, uh, which did include um, South African uh, Afrikaners and Zulus on this tour. So uh, from 1937, let's hear Molly Pecan with Rudy Valley. Did you have a good time seeing the world, Molly? Uh, Rudy, I'm so stuffed full of mileage, I really don't know yet. I haven't had much time to stop and think, you know. I've just traveled 55,000 miles, all on one song. All on one song? Well, mainly on one song. Of course, I did pick up a few new ones here and there. In Ireland, for instance, Rudy, last June. Oh, Rudy, June in Ireland. Yes, Molly, June in Ireland. Yes, Rudy, June in Ireland. June, woolen socks, woolen sweaters, woolen under... Yes, Molly. Well, you know, I asked one of the stagehands, I said, for heaven's sakes, when do you have summer here? And he answered, last year we had it on a Wednesday. <laughs> but my God, what audiences, and how this song stirred my 80s Irish blood. <laughs> With my shillelagh under my arm and a twinkle in the eye, I'll be off to Tipperary in the morning. With my shillelagh under my arm and a tula rula lie, I'll be welcome in the town that I was born in. Sure, my mother told the neighbors that I'm gonna settle down. Feel the flute is coming out to play me round the town with a shillelagh under the arm and a twinkle in the eye. I'll be off to Tipperary in the morning. That song paid your way in Ireland? Well, that song and the other song. My next stop was Africa, Rudy, Zululand, the original nudist camp. Diamond mines, gold mines, the jungle, cannibals, lions, tigers, cities hundreds of miles apart. You know that people travel hundreds of miles to see a show, Rudy, but they've all got radios. And do you know what the favorite song of the Zulu girls is? No, Molly, what is the favorite song of the Zulu girls? My time is your time. I don't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll mention that one thing I don't have to play for you uh, is an appearance that Molly Pekin made on 
NBC about three years after this. The rec no recording of it appears to survive, but it did air nationally on NBC. And this is when she was appearing on Broadway in a Jewish-themed English-language show that featured her and a number of other greats of the Yiddish theater. And it, the, um, the broadcast was of her with uh, Joseph Buloff doing a scene from, the, uh, from Morningstar. And it's, it's in NBC logs, but not in the, um, the NBC collection that has come down to us, unfortunately. She did, yeah. yeah. I mean, Molly Picon was, um, <clears throat> did lots and lots of radio, um, <clears throat> but most of it was not uh, heard nationally, at least on the network. These, uh, everything that I am playing is from the, the holdings of the Library of Congress. Much of it's from the NBC collection. Yeah. No, I'm afraid they're not. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, if there are any questions so far, I'll take them. Yes, please. Oh yeah, certainly what Schlepperman was doing. Um, I've, I've found you know, positive coverage of, of uh, Sam Hearn in the Jewish press, uh, interviewing him and uh, you know, talking about how he felt that, you know, yes, his characterizations were very comic, but you know, it came from the heart. And this was a, you know, Schlepperman you know, with all of his, his malaprops and so on was you know, somebody that uh, people could, could understand. You know. Oh, in the secular press. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he was very popular. The fact that, I mean, he had um, originated the character on the Jack Benny show in, in 32 or 33, and he'd been a fixture of the show for four or five years and then left. But, you know, the uh, uh, George Jessel wanted him to come back on as Schlepperman in 1939. And, uh, you know, he reprised that character on, on radio and, and elsewhere. Uh, and, you know, he and his brother Lou Hearn we're often doing a character like that, even if it wasn't called Schlepperman. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's, um, it's like a lot of the, uh, the ethnic characters of, of radio and film at the time. Certainly, um, you know, it's a, um, there's a, uh, I think they got over on a certain amount of warmth that they brought to it, the best of them. And in the case of the, the Hearn brothers, they were Jewish. Uh, so, you know, to the extent that that, uh, you know, could, um, you know, <laughs> for their for their defense, I suppose you could say, um, yes. Yes. Was that, were they joint audiences at that time? No, no. She talks about that in her autobiography. Yeah. Um, and some of her interactions with, uh, with Zulus, you know, were more informal. You know, she w really wanted to see the country and get around. And so she, uh, you know, she got out and, uh, and, and met people you know, in that way. And I think she describes some impromptu performances that, sh that she did. The song that she, um, uh, it's not in the clip that I have, but the, um, uh, she does an Afrikaner song that she picked up while there, and she's actually sort of transformed it. You know, she starts singing the, the Afrikaans, and then th in the second half, she's freely mixing Afrikaans with English and making it much more of a uh, dialect piece. landed on her feet without having touched her hands to the stage and then said to the audience, I know what you're thinking, wie alt is sie? <laughs> and she'd have been in her 60s at that time. Yeah.
If I'm correct, Eddie Cantor had a character on his radio program called the Chinese philosopher Fang Zikhan. <laughs> <laughs> One of the uh, great legends of the Yiddish theater, Marius Schwartz. Uh, he appears here with uh, Molly Steinberg of the Stage Relief Fund program. This was a Depression era organization that uh, organized uh, uh, benefit performances for actors, among other things. Uh, this was a very, it was a short program, five minute program, sort of squeezed in between uh, shows. Uh, on NBC, uh, but we get to hear him talking about his current production in 1938, the, the Brothers Ashkenazi by I.J. Singer, one of his uh, uh, great successes. Um, as you'll hear, he spoke uh, wonderfully cultivated English in spite of the fact that he was born in Russia. Uh, in her autobiography, though, Molly Pekin says that if he got angry or excited, he spoke <laughs> pure New Yorkese, as she puts it. So. Uh, this, uh, this sound file, I believe, is just called Stage Relief Fund. And now it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to introduce to you a gentleman who has in his own field made theatrical history. A man who for years, as a director, manager, and star of his own distinguished productions, won the acclaim of critics everywhere. I refer, of course, to Mr. Maurice Schwartz, now playing the leading role in his own production, The Brothers Ashkenazi, with Samuel Goldenberg as the twin brother at the Yiddish Art Theater, 7th Avenue and 58th Street. Mr. Schwartz. Thank you. How does your present production, The Brothers Ashkenazi, compare with your previous successes? The reason for that success may be attributed to the human qualities, the universal appeal, and the great message of the story. It is the same reason that makes Shakespeare, even at this time, such a great drawing power in the theater. His conceptions of life were so profoundly deep and powerful. Of course, I.J. Singer, the author of Brothers Ashkenazi, is not in competition with the immortal Bob, but he does know life and is a great psychologist. Critics have rightly acclaimed him as the modern Tolstoy. Like the great Russian author, Singer has a deep and sympathetic insight of life and a thorough understanding of human nature. So, uh, let's see if this is working. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm speechless. Okay, well, Maurice Schwartz, again, seven years later, this time on Mary Margaret McBride's uh, very popular national program. Um, and the other guest that day was Henry Morton Robinson, the writer uh, probably best known for his novel, The Cardinal, I as well as... as um, Schwartz is oh. sitting here, thank you oh. all the same. Well, I'll let them take it away. <laughs> too has an allegory, haven't you, Maurice? Mm, yes. Tell about your allegory. Well, my allegory is my theater. Uh, I was thinking and, and hoping that the theater in the post-war days would be somewhat different than it was, or than it is even now. Just as Mr. Robinson explained that he had in mind to bring happiness to people in writing this book and what you expressed, Miss McBride, by coming back from this torturous country that you visited, England and others, that you felt that something must be done to heal the souls of people. The theater must do the same thing. When we see a good play, when we see a fine picture, when we hear fine music, we leave the theater with a wonderful thought. We go home to our families, we talk about the play. We want to return to the theater again. Because when I can go back to the times of the Grecian days, when the people in their greatest misery have asked for circuses and bread, they wanted theater, they wanted entertainment. And during this, these crucial days, we know, and it is a positive fact, we know what the, what the USO has done for, to help win the war. We know what Russia has done with sending the finest and best plays. You'd be surprised, Miss McBride, that the Russian government found it necessary to send plays to the front, plays by Chekhov, plays by Shakespeare, the finest and greatest drama besides musicals and so on. 
That only proves that we need theater. Theater heals the soul and brings happiness to people. And uh, we, in our own way, the Yiddish Heart Theater, which was founded in 1918, it is an institution which is now celebrating its 26th year this coming season with the opening of a play which is also, I wouldn't say allegorical, but symbolic. It is a musical fantasy which I hope will bring happiness to people. Although spoken in Yiddish, as Mr. Robinson said when he met me, he said that he, he likes the Jewish actors. Why? Because they have a certain warmth, uh, a certain reality. It isn't a question of just simply a job, just coming up on the stage and play your part and wait for your envelope. There's a certain ideal about things. Well, <laughs> this, I can say that the same thing of myself. For 25 years, I've done everything possible to organize and create an institution, a theatrical institution, which is an American institution, founded in this country, founded in this New York at the old Irving Place Theater, if you remember, Miss McBride. Yes. We were you there? Yes. The time when the Irving Place Theater was played by the German troupe, very fine actors. The Germans are very splendid actors. I wish they do other things as good as they act. <laughs> um, the day before, Mary Marmot McBride had uh, returned to the air after being away for several weeks. She had been in Europe touring there, and uh, what she saw had been the subject of a very dramatic broadcast the previous day, and you know that was discussed uh, on this broadcast, and I, I think it was uh, uh, part of the reason for, for the tone of uh, this particular broadcast of uh, Mary Mc Margaret McBride's show. Okay, I have uh, just one more slide and uh, clip. And uh, this manifestation of uh, Yiddish culture is a somewhat ironic one in that it's a radio adaptation of Shola Mash's uh, version of the life of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. This aired on NBC radio on um, Easter Sunday, 1950. And uh, the adaptations by Ernest Canoy, in order to adapt the, the novel, which is quite long and complex, he had to greatly simplify the narrative, uh, though he kept one uh, interesting detail, which is that the, um, uh, the soldiers who uh, uh, lash Christ uh, are uh, German mercenaries. So uh, this is the last clip. We'll hear just a little bit from the opening of uh, The Nazarene as it aired on NBC University Theater in 1950. Today we bring you a fascinating and provocative historical novel, The Nazarene by Sholem Ash. Written originally in Yiddish, it has been translated into English by Maurice Samuel, and today it undergoes a further translation into the language of radio. From Sholem Ash's 700-page book, Ernest Kanoy of NBC has distilled a powerful hour-length drama, The Nazarene. Hear it now from the NBC Theater in Hollywood. This is the story of the Nazarene, who lived in the Roman province of Judea in the reign of Tiberius Caesar. It'll be told in three parts, in the words of three men. The first, Cornelius, Roman commander of the Antonia Fortress in the city of Jerusalem. My acquaintance with Pontius Pilate, the procurator of Judea, dates back to the time when we both served as centurions in the German wars. So that when Pilate set out for Judea, I received the post of military commander of the province. As our legions approached Jerusalem, Pilate waved me to his litter and issued orders. Cornelius, how much longer to the city? An hour's march to the Antonio Fortress. Special orders for the cohorts. The eagles, the images of the gods, and the pictures of the emperor are to be covered. What? Have them wrapped well. Cover the Roman eagles? You have a great deal to learn, Cornelius. The Jews have special religious privileges. No image may be shown in the city. The strategy of Rome is to recognize these barbarian religions. Oh, but to cover the eagles... You may what? notice, Cornelius, that there are no delegations to meet me. 
No cheering crowds, no flowers in the streets. This is no accident. They are proud people, these Judeans. Give the order to cover the eagles. So we marched into Jerusalem, through deserted streets and marketplaces, across the bridge that led to the massive stone courts and pillars of the temple. The temple of Jehovah, the barbarian god of the Jews. There in the shops and booths of the outer court, we sounded the halt. So, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Itzik. Thank you, Alan. We don't have time for questions. And sorry, too. These were wonderful presentations, and I enjoyed them very much. I'm sure that you did, too. Now, I spent the last two weeks watching the political conventions, and I noticed that all of the speakers spoke more about themselves than they did about the candidates. I'm going to follow in their steps. Before I retired, I already told you that I retired, I was a rabbi, a cantor, a professor of Yiddish, a Zionist and a Reconstructionist. All of those were due to my, the influence of Yiddish radio. I became a rabbi because rabbis were on the radio. As a matter of fact, I myself was a Yiddish actor on a series of programs on WEVD on Saturday nights for a few years, presented by the Mizrahi Zionist Religious Organization. They were run by the Yiddish actor Chaim Ostrovsky. So I loved the rabbis that appeared on the, on the radio. I also went to the Yiddish theater and saw Maurice Schwartz. Rabbis were just wonderful figures. I didn't know what, what it would be like, but you have a congregation. That came later. Now every rabbi is a frustrated cantor. From the Yiddish radio, I heard cantors. I went to a small synagogue that never, had, never hired professional cantors. I heard the cantors in the synagogue. Three years ago, my daughter, Rachel, who's sitting here, called me in New York and said, Daddy, I've decided to become a cantor. I said, Rachel, you never showed the slightest interest in it. Why all of a sudden do you want, she already had two master's degrees in other things. I said, why do you want to become a cantor? She said, Daddy, you always played the records. <laughs> and I learned about the records from Yiddish radio. And by the way, the great star was not only Maurice Ganshaf, as was ma ma mentioned, but also Labela Waldman, who was famous for Chaveirim kol Yisroel, Ayidav gain in shul, Chaveirim kol Yisroel, Ayidav gain in shul, and Zogn v'noi maromein. Then I became professor of Yiddish because I heard all of these programs. I came home from school every afternoon and turned on the Yiddish radio. And when the WEVD ended its broadcasting of Yiddish programs for the day, I turned to WLIB, which also had Yiddish programming. Now I became a Zionist. I became a Zionist mostly because of Hebrew songs. In the late 40s and early 50s, there was only one recording of Zionist Israeli songs produced in America that sold like hotcakes. And that was the recording by the cantor Moshe Nathanson, who set the words that he wrote to the old Hasidic melody, which we now know as Havad Agila. His, his record was played almost every morning at 8.15 on WEVD for years. So I learned all of those songs. Gamal Gimali, Kuma Echa, Havad Agila, Yerushalayim, became a Zionist. Finally, from WEVD and WLIB and the Yiddish theater, I got involved in Yiddish literature. And I was influenced by the fact that WEVD catered not only to the socialists and not only to the Orthodox Jews, but to every trend and movement in Jewish life. 
and I have to admit that I loved them all. Even those that were out to kill each other, I loved them all. That made me a Reconstructionist. Reconstructionism teaches that Judaism is a civilization, and as long as it keeps the Jewish people going and the Jewish business going, it's great. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you so much to Nancy Gross. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.